It's just oh, there we go. It's taking forever. It was like starting, starting. I was like, yeah, yeah. Is he, is he gonna click the button? Are we gonna do it? <laughs> oh, Wait, a big joke. What? Episode two hundred, huh? Okay, here we are. <laughs> Anyone watching live is getting a treat. Joshua will probably have edited that out from the actual recording. Uh, Joshua, please edit that out from the actual recording. Or edit in at the end is a funny thing. Yeah, considering it's a very special episode and everything, we don't want to look like a couple of clowns. Like we've never done this before. Who the heck are we? For crying yeah. out loud. God. Well, they know who you are. Do they? Do they really? <laughs> Do they know who I am? They should. They really should. <laughs> this shit hold down. <laughs> oh, you missed your opportunity, buddy. I did. I did. Oh, I was disappointed. I really was. Uh, oh man. <laughs> so anyway, welcome to War Gaming Recon. I am your host, Jonathan J. Reinhardt. War Gaming Recon is the only member of the TSR Podcast Network to discuss historical and New England gaming. This is episode two. Hundred. That's right. You heard right. Episode two zero zero. So I want to welcome all of you here because, as you can guess, two hundred is a very special episode. We're going to share a lot of things. A lot of things said by listeners like you, and I don't expect you to remember them, but you should. And instead of remembering them, we make life a little easier here at Wargaming Recon. We do it by creating show notes that you can go to. Visit wargamingrecon.com slash WR200. Wargamingrecon.com slash WR200. You go there, you'll see the stuff that we talked about. There'll be links and all that good stuff. You can even listen to the episode if you like. You can download it, leave reviews, comments, whatever. All through the show notes. Don't worry, we'll remind you of the URL throughout the episode. <laughs> Today, I am joined by my friend and co-host, Mr. Adrian Benson. Adrian, how are you today? Doing great, John. How are you? I'm doing... Do you know, I'm excited, and we're going to talk about excitement <laughs> a little later in this episode, but apparently excitement is something for which we are known. I feel we funny. Are? Yeah, I, well, I feel funny saying that to you because people have questioned about whether you get excited about anything. They've seen pictures of us playing games and you being happy. Yeah, <laughs> and just wondering, like, do you smile? What brings you joy? And do you ever laugh? These are questions people. Do you laugh? These are questions people have. They want to know. I've I laugh. You've seen me laugh. I have seen you laugh usually at me. Yeah, because you do a lot of really stupid things. So <laughs> I laugh at that. Um, yeah, I suppose I'm not super emotional. I I'm like not. unlike you. I, I'm always a person with a smile on my face <laughs> and I'll you'll laugh. also you'll also cry at the drop of a hat. I bet most of the listeners don't know that. I I believe the modern phrase is I'm a very sensitive man in touch with my feelings. I think that's what we're supposed to say. I see. Or at least that's what I'm told I was supposed to say. Well, that's not how I would characterize it, but whatever. You mean the Hallmark commercials don't just make you cry? Or, or remember that Budweiser one, right? And it was like the, the horses going through the town and it was all patriotic or whatever. And they're like, we love America or whatever. That was supposed to make people cry. I, yeah, that was, I didn't cry. That was a great commercial though, but no, I didn't uh, I didn't cry. I don't know. You're heartless. No, it's not, uh, that's not really true. But uh, to get any kind of what I guess people consider an excited reaction or something, yeah, it's got to be pretty special. And... <laughs> Most of the time when I'm hanging around with you, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. So I guess that's why they've never seen it. We'll have to work on that, I guess. We have to make things more special for you. Yeah, I can't, yourself. can't wait to see how that's going to... Oh, God. well, <laughs> I know how we can do that, but I can't say it on air. Yeah. <laughs> we keep that for the special after hours version of the show. Yeah, yeah. This oh, is God. a family-friendly show here. We keep things very PG-13. Yeah. We're dry. So 200, right? You haven't been here for all 200. Thank you, Lucky Stars. But <laughs> you've been here for quite a few of them. Yeah, more than I ever expected to when we started doing it, yeah. Can you imagine this is episode 200? Um, yeah, I, I would say in total I've probably listened to, uh, I don't know, five of the episodes myself. But um, yeah, no, 200 is a lot. 
you talk a lot though. So it's not as incredible you doing it as it would be like some normal person doing it. You mean like you, <laughs> we, we get two and a half. Hours. Yeah. 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 You were like, I'm done. Just like, go ahead. Get out of here. <laughs> really? It's like the end of Ferris Bueller. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. go on, leave. It's over. Leave. It's over. <laughs> really go. The movie's yeah. done. Don't you know? Get out of here. So kids these days would have no idea who Fer- Ferris Bueller is. Would they? I bet a lot of them don't. That's too bad. That was such an awesome movie. Amazing movie. Great soundtrack. Fun plot. Yeah. It was hilarious. As a kid, I really thought that they ruined oh, <laughs> that incredibly good. valuable car. And I was oh, so God. sad. And then I was happy when I learned that they made one. That's good. As a note to the listeners, when I watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off, I, I laugh because it's funny. Oh, they, they see everyone needs to go and watch Ferris Bueller's Day. It must be on Netflix or something. Look it gotta up. Be. Yeah. Somewhere you've got to be able to find it. Hulu somewhere. Do you have a favorite scene in there? Probably when they're trying to back the miles off of uh, off the Ferrari. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so I, I enjoy, and this actually brings it a little bit back to or gaming, but I enjoy. There's a a parade that happens in. I don't want to ruin the film for anyone, but there's a parade that happens in it, and the character Ferris Bueller gets up and dances and and sings. Uh, it's a very memorable scene. You probably have seen it on YouTube if you're a younger person, or if you're someone our age and older, you've actually seen it in the movie. But uh, he sings, and what people may not realize is it, that was actually a German pride parade. <laughs> and so most of the people marching in it and on the floats and everything were of German origin and did not speak English nor really understand what was going on. And so the movie just kind of crashed the parade. <laughs> and they just filmed it. And they're like, here we go. And so he's like, I'm going to, you know, you think I would remember what he's saying. But he, he's singing and he's on the float and doing his thing. Yeah. And and everyone else is just like, we're German. What's going on? <laughs> <coughs> but he, it brings it back to Wargaming because much like a parade, many manufacturers are a, a growing number of them actually are creating models for things like marching bands, military parades, and yeah. other figures that you wouldn't have seen 5, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. There's an upst- upcoming Kickstarter which I'm sure we'll cover at a later point. It's going to be a smaller Kickstarter from Dwarven Forge. They actually have another big one coming out later in 2018, but a smaller one is going to be for more miniatures. And so they're doing a lot of discussions on their internet message boards about how people want them made. Do they want metal? Do they want painted? Do they want them made out of the Dwarvenite? And what poses do you want? And I bet you won't guess what the number one pose that people want. I don't know. They want townspeople who are sitting down. Really? Huh. And the thinking from what I've seen from a lot of these people is that they have this Dwarven Forge stuff. Um, they got the city builder stuff. Oh, no, you can build towns and cities. And right. we have videos of that on um, you know YouTube and everywhere. And they get the castle stuff. And you have your adventure band. And you got some monstery things like rat people and so forth. You even have some villagers. But you don't really have anyone who's dead. So they don't have casualties that they can use. Yeah. You don't have anyone sitting down, so it's hard. Like if you have a, a wagging or any sort of, you know, vehicle that's going on. And keep in mind, this is fantasy, so really like medieval for any historical people. You can't, they can't be anything. Well, what if you're in an inn or you're in a building, and you want to have some people represented as being in there? Is yeah. everyone going to be sitting like they stand on the chair? Yeah, no, it's that's not. Actually, I mean, yeah, it's no. not my first pick, but I can understand it. Yeah, I can see why people would do it, but I, I suspect a lot of people, I mean, seems like a lot, well, maybe I shouldn't say a lot, but more and more people seem to be picking up like the Dwarven Forge stuff and, and other other train kits like that and try to really go with the the full immersion in their D&D games and D&D campaigns. So, yeah, I guess I can probably see that. But yeah, seated townspeople, that's not what I would have picked. I would have picked Dwarf Chugging Beer, maybe, if I was going to pick one. I don't think that was on the list, but again, that'd be a good one. Yeah. And so you never know. I mean, I never would have thought that a manufacturer would make like a marching band, but I'm pretty sure that there's a, some new plastics out. Maybe from, I don't know if it's Vesda. I feel like it is, but it might be like in a uh, new IMAX kit. And it's like a marching band. Like, That's what not, do you need a marching band for? Yeah, I don't know. You don't. Well, unless but, you're a diorama builder, but if you're a gamer, I can't think of why. But remember when we were doing... um 
muskets and tomahawks and we wanted villagers we wanted just like some civilians for to be in for the scenario we were doing for a total con we couldn't we find them no those are fairly easy to come by in 28 millimeter but not in 54 no yeah so there you go and i mean the um dwarven forge stuff is 25 so you could use a 28 but oh I mean, yeah technically it's 25 so almost one um 70 second scale yeah huh. good stuff coming forward and i mentioned this not only because of the connection to Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which I know that we discussed on the show. I do love that movie. Um, but also because we had reached out to listeners before this episode, and we wanted to kind of gauge from them some of the stuff that they wanted us to talk about in this episode. And one of the things that people had mentioned was that they wanted to hear more about stuff that we have planned for this year and things that we don't have um maybe not really discussed a whole lot about the past for the show so one of the things we'll be doing this year is we actually do have uh, a plan to have stefan pokorny who is the head honcho for dwarf and forge he's going to come on and talk about what they're doing there we're actually going to be covering the kickstarters which will be pretty neat and i am intending to back one or more of them I'm not quite sure at what level because stuff, while gorgeous, and it really is, it is not what I would call affordable. It's definitely a luxury gaming item. Yeah, I would say that. I mean, it's the prices aren't like through the roof, but it's uh, yeah, it's definitely not a casual pickup either. Wonderful, and I think very utilitarian because yeah. even for like a war gamer like us, we could use it for just about anything. But um, again. Yeah, some of it you could. I mean, there's a lot of, there's no shortage of fantasy, like skirmish type stuff that it would be very useful for outside of role playing and whatnot. So yeah, you know, it's, 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 um, it's worth the money. I'll put it that way. No, definitely. And I mean, like some of the dungeony stuff, maybe not so much for us. Right. But they're doing a lot more of above ground world building. Yeah. So things like uh, more buildings and um, pieces to enlarge your buildings. So for our, any sort of skirmish that we want to do in any of the castle stuff. I mean, yeah. really, they got a castle that I just love. And it's like $3,000 or something like that. <laughs> and I would love to have it, but I, I can just picture us playing an easy setup, easy takedown. And I don't know. I can too. Let me know what Trisha says. <laughs> yeah, my wife would <laughs> not be in favor of me. So I have to, not that I have $3,000 to spend on it either. <laughs> but if I did, I tell you, I would I'd spend it on that. Oh, my word. I'd be like, let me go get that castle. Yeah. And I looked on their website because they, they're restocking some of the stuff. And of yeah. course, I'd want to paint it because I'm not going to paint right. the whole castle. Just, because there's so many other... I love to paint now. I do. But there's so much stuff to do. I can't paint it all. And I looked yeah. and I, I was like, well, it's only $250. And that was the down payment. <laughs> like, that, <laughs> that saves your spot. Oh, my God. Like, yeah. No, I <laughs> just I can't do. I was like, I get two hundred fifty dollars. I can give that. I got money at curse. I can put that. And then I was like, oh wait, no. Yeah. I won't be able to give them anything else. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, some things that people might not realize actually about the past about the show is we've had all their co-hosts in the past. Some of them have lasted longer than others. No. So Adrian, I'm sorry if you thought you were the first co-host. I hate to burst your bubble, buddy. It's not yeah, true. that'll that'll ruin my day. I thought it might. So way way back, we had a co-host here named Tom, who is popular and famous enough to have his own Wikipedia article. He's written a book, and he is very tangentially associated with um, what's his name from WikiLeaks. That uh, they think that maybe what's his name from WikiLeaks. <laughs> Julian Assange. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, they think that maybe he received some of the coding that helped um, WikiLeaks operate and get access to stuff. So, like, he was visited by the FBI, and he's really into like artificial life and simulations. And he's created all this stuff, and he's from Australia. And so, Tom's a brilliant guy, and also loves gaming. Oddly enough, so way way back, he was on the show, and at one point, we thought of renaming and rebranding the show as Monty in the Fox, if you can believe it. Because he, although from in Australia, he's actually 
a British origin and Australian origin and uh, thought it would be a good fit. And we were going to try to pivot more towards World War II games. Mm. We did not do that. Uh, yeah. He moved on to other projects. Uh, also had another host, someone you and I both know, uh, Drew McCarthy, who uh, was involved for a very little bit because he and I did another show where we talked about just other non wargaming kind of stuff, but like geekdom related. Yeah. So we did that sort of stuff. And then he was starting his own show and things migrated away. Uh, you notice all these people leave. Uh, and then another person who was a listener and then came on the show, Aaron, uh, did several episodes and really was interested in more of like games workshop kind of games to the point that he got me excited about them. And I was like, maybe I will buy and play and paint and do stuff. Um, he's very interested. And part of the reason why he left was that he got very heavily involved in the Nova tournaments and mm -hmm. doing a lot of GW gaming down where he is. So he does a lot of organizing and he's actually involved to some degree with, um, I can't remember the name of it, but the uh, HMGS um, convention that they do in Williamsburg. Oh, okay. Uh, so he helps out there and he goes and I think it was fallen and all that kind of stuff. So he's yeah. into all that, but he's really drawn towards the fantasy and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so it's neat to see what he does, uh, but they have their own gaming group down where he's in in the mid-Atlantic states, and he's a big organizer down there and helps out with stuff. So he's kind of moved on. And then Adrian Yu and the current cast of co-hosts are like the new incarnation. And it feels weird to always be migrating through people. But at the same time, the show's been around for like a long time, so I don't expect anyone to stay. Yeah, especially at the, at the rate of pay you can afford. Well, you know, we are doing quite well now, actually. Because I got our Patreon statement. And like for last year, it's like over 500 bucks. Huh. I'm going to quit my job. <laughs> there you go. I was like, over 500 bucks. That's more than I ever imagined the show ever making. Yeah. It was quite impressive. We are almost hey. revenue neutral. That is not bad. That is no, not, not bad. at all. I mean, a lot of shows are revenue negative forever. And then they yeah. flame out. We stick around. Well, you do at least. Well, it's because I'm too stubborn or stupid to leave. That second one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> oh well, we actually have some other cool stuff planned for this year. Yeah. So I mentioned we're going to be covering those Kickstarters, right? Yep. You and I are going to be going to Havoc, potentially. And we're definitely doing Huzzah. Definitely doing Huzzah. And word on the street is you considering running a game at Huzzah this year. Um. Yeah, that was the word on the street. The street gets a lot of stuff wrong. Well, considering the street was you, <laughs> is that still on the table? Will listeners potentially be able to see a game being run? Uh, potentially. I will have to figure out what it's going to be. I don't want to. I kind of don't want to do something that everybody else is going to do because right now we're really kind. of Don't want it to be bold action. I don't want it to be black powder. Um, the theme's going to be it's world gonna war be one. Anything, Oh yeah, that's not going to happen. No, well, I'm not saying for us to do World War One. I'm saying if they're doing all World War One stuff, that frees up yeah, anything else. Yeah, it does. But I mean, it, despite the theme being World War One, it's it's going to be it's going to be a lot of World War Two stuff because the other thing is they're uh, they're gearing up for is um, uh, Tony Rieger's starting to spin it up. What is it? Uh, is it Monte Casino this year? He wants to do. Oh, it might be. I know I he's bringing his Stalingrad table back though. Yeah, yeah. So th there's going to be a lot of. Anyway, Hazard doesn't need another bold action game. So uh, we'll New Bedford it is. <laughs> uh, we could we could do that in the board game room. Um, that would be fine. Uh, maybe if uh, and hopefully everybody understands this is in no way a promise. Uh, Blood and plunder potentially. Oh, yeah, no, definitely not a promise, but exciting nonetheless. Yeah, I think, I think you and I both know someone who would be really excited if that were to happen, and would potentially even have some material that they'd be able to lend for the game. Yeah, potentially. Um, so if, if I do anything at all, and I've got a lot of work to do, uh, yeah, it'll be blood and plunder, but no promises. It's just kind of a sort of a half idea. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. See, the thing with, with Huzzah is it's like when you run a game, I mean, I, you'd like to do it and help them out, but it also sucks up a lot of your playing time, obviously. Well, it depends how long the game is. I mean. Well, it'll be four if... hours. Oh, yeah. They don't do smaller blocks, do they? They only do the four hour block. Uh, that I'm not sure about, but 
what whatever they do for block sizes, the game would be four hours. So no, the, I think they do only do four hour blocks. Uh, yeah. Unlike Total Con that has a two hour block sections, and you can link them together. Yeah. I think because that only does because they do the three time slots per day, morning, um, day, right, and evening, and they are four hour blocks. So like if you ended early, I guess you could just end early for like a New Bedford or something. But it's still it's a four hour block. Yeah. You're right. So I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. So on the table, maybe. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I knew the theme was. I kind of wanted to do World War One naval, but there's absolutely no way that's going to happen. Well, it's funny you should say that. There is a way we could do it using stuff that we already have that would not involve any painting or anything, and it would be pretty easy to transport as well. Yeah, you thinking the pl- the uh, paper? Uh... Nope. No. No. Although, good guess. So we have. I have. It's just about every single war at sea ship made. Many of them are World War One, and there's a vibrant online community where they've created stat cards for their World War One versions. The ships are painted. You can play using the existing play mat and all the other stuff, and just use the different stat cards. Yeah, no. <laughs> very accessible, very cadet friendly. That's their um kid uh, accessible gaming stuff. Right. Um, I will talk about that later. Uh, if, if we do it, then... yeah, not going to use this, the. You're right that a lot of the ships that are in the Axis and Allies set are are you know World War Two or rather World War One era, but not the ships that you would want like the, the ships that were dogger bank and stuff like that. And that's what I would do would probably be something like that. They're, they're not in access and allies, uh, but there are ways to do it on the cheap. Um, and that's actually something that I didn't even consider was um, doing it as one of the cadet games and doing it that way would make the uh, using the paper ships. Perfect. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll think about that. Something to consider. Yeah. Sometimes I have a good idea. Sometimes. Yeah, it happens. It happens. Not always, so, but every so often. Yeah. All right. Something to think about then. Did not consider the cadet games, but that's not a bad idea. See, just one of the many ways that this 200th episode is very special. It is. A- another is the whole theme is what one game would you share with another gamer? Something that you love or you think is really innovative or you're passionate about or you just think would be a great new thing for another gamer to try. And so we reached out to the community here of gamers, people who listen to the show and love to play tabletop games. And we said, hey, so what would you pick? And instead of a traditional mailbag section for the episode, we thought we'd mix it up a little bit. And first of all, change the order. I know. Crazy, right? Um, But also, instead of having like a piece of feedback, we thought we would share what listeners have said. So Adrian, do you want to kick us off? Um, but, 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 yeah, I gotta the find answer. it on. Gotta find <laughs> it on the list here. First of all, the answer is yes, and second of all is, while I look for it. <laughs> yeah, you're not the uh, you're not the boss of me. If I didn't want to do it, I said no, and then just sat here. Uh, okay. So you want me to read the one from Alyssa? Is that it? Uh, sure, you can start with the very first one on the list. Are you giving me a hard time? I am giving you a hard time, <laughs> and with a smile too. Service with a smile. That makes it okay. It does. All right. Okay, so going. all right. So Alyssa, these are these are games that you would uh say it again. So share with another player? Yeah. All right. One maybe they never heard of or that the person thinks that's another gamer should try. Right. Okay, so Alyssa from Enfilade says, Bear yourselves valiantly. Uh the reasons she lists for that are double activation method, interesting dice for attacks and counterattacks. Um, I have to admit, I'm not actually familiar with that uh, that game or that rule set. Are you? I am not. And actually, when I read what she commented, I, I thought maybe she mistyped it. And I was like, bear, bear. I'm thinking there's a bunch of like teddy bears or polar bears or something going around. But apparently, it's a whole series of games where they all use this similar... Uh, mechanics in it and it's supposed to be very accessible very easy to get and also pretty affordable from what i understand 
Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes at wargamingrecon.com slash WR200 so we'll be able to actually see the game and click on it and, and go to it. I don't have it, and I've never heard of this game before or this uh, rule system, really. But if it's coming from Alyssa, I'm going to trust her because she is an established wargamer and game designer, and of course she helps organize Enfilade, and they are sponsors of Wargaming Recon. So I'm going to trust that she knows what she's doing and that she's given a really good recommendation here. Okay. Lawrence happens to say, Command and Conquer's Ancients. Easy to teach, easy to play, great tactile feel, and just great fun. You play the game and not the rules. Any game where you don't have to get bogged down in rules is one that I think is just a great game to do. Yeah, I'd agree with that, especially if you're trying to teach it to somebody who's, you know, not a, not a, not even not just a war gamer, but not a gamer in general. Um, yeah. And of course, it would even be better if I said the correct name of the game, which would be Command and Colors, and Command and Conquer being a computer game. That would uh, that would have been much better. I uh, and professional know, too. To and professional as a as a mere co-host, I wasn't sure if it was my duty to correct you there or not. It hasn't stopped you before. Um, but yeah, you you fixed it, so everything is good. CNC Ancients, people, check it out. And there's a whole series of them, actually. And there are, there's, yeah. CNC. I mean, for a lot of people that, and I don't know how you feel about this, Agent, but for a lot of people, they kind of bridge that whole board game, minis game kind of thing. Uh, they do kind of. I mean, people say that about it. I, to me, it's definitely there's. It's it's a board game, but there's nothing wrong with that. So yeah, no. Although having said that, I've I've played in games where people have used the command and color rules, but done it as a uh, as a miniatures game without the uh, without the boards. So yeah, you could yeah, that's fair to say that it bridges the uh, bridges the gap or the distance between the two. I guess our buddy Court is a big fan, and uh, Henry Hyde over there. Uh, Game designer, author, friend of the show. He's a big fan of CNC as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Is it my turn again now? Well, one would think it would go more smoothly if you just transitioned, but why? Yes. I think you would have fun sharing the next one on the list. Okay, then. <laughs> I'm going to keep giving you a hard time all night. It's fine with me. All right. Jay Harrison says I'd go with Operation Tannhauser. It's a first-person shooter with great painted minis, minis, lots of room to roam, and several great, uh, great map boards. Easy to teach, and you're in the middle of things quickly. The options are endless. Pick your teams, open scenarios, and you can add whatever you like, rabid dogs, zombies, and such from other games. You can even take the uh, Mansions of Madness or Gears of War and create new battles. Great game. All right, so... Yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. Any game, first of all, I'm kind of a, pa- a fan of uh, skirmish level games like that anyway. Um, but anything that is kind of open world or open ended and expandable, that's, uh, yeah, that's something I would definitely give a try. The uh, Blurb on Board Game Geek actually sounds pretty interesting. Uh, War has been going on for 35 years mm. and it takes place in 1949. So it has like kind of a horror, sci fi. Uh, aspect to it and get this blending of like almost steampunk i think i'm not saying the world uses steam technology but kind of like an alternate technology sort of thing and that's pretty decent ratings too on their six and a half that's pretty good actually for them because they're um they're pretty hard on games they're, actually on they're, game game. they're actually yeah they're pretty harsh yeah but they uh, say you can play with up to 10 players and take between an hour and two hours to play i like that yeah not bad at all nope not at all. I think we're going to have to add that to our list of games to track down and uh, give a try. Okay. Cool. Glenn happens to say, way to go! Two games! We said one, Glenn. One. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving you our time. Uh, two games. Sharp Practice 2 for the small model count and driving storyline built in, along with Fire and Fury. Regimental. Who doesn't love the ACW, American Civil War? And the rules just keep working well. And okay. A third. Really? You are pulling a me here, buddy. You are getting many games into one, and I'm famous for doing this, so I'm going to let it slide. (laughs) A third. Sword in the Flame. Colonial fighting. Hordes of Zulu or Afghans or whatever. Very literary. 
thank you for the submission, Glenn. And I am familiar with shot practice and I've heard of fire and fury. I do not know anything about sword and flame. How about you? I do. Uh, I've, I know I've sharp practice, so I want to give it a try. It's Skirmish Love and Napoleonics from uh, Two Fat Lardies. Uh, Fire and Fury Regimental is a game I love. I've played it a fair bit. Um, I've got the rules. We we haven't played it yet. We will. we got a lot of stuff to get to. You've played uh, a lot of games, actually. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Fire and Fury Regimental is an is a outstanding set of, uh, of American Civil War rules. Um, it's really kind of hard for me to pick a, a favorite set uh but it would i guess at this point of the ones that i've tried it will probably be a tie between johnny reb and, and regimental fire and fury there is if you can find it i think it's out of print now they also offer uh there's regimental fire and fury but it's uh brigade level so a, a larger scale so whereas at the the regimental level it's well it's what it says it's very much more tactical uh, but the brigade level is more like you're maneuvering as an army commander and you can actually on the tabletop play an entire, you know, huge battle, uh, of, you know, say Gettysburg or something like that. Uh, you'd have to have a really big table to do that with regimental, but, uh, anyway, and, um, <coughs> sorry. And yeah, the other one, sword in the flame. I've played that a lot too. I've got those rules. I don't have any, uh, I don't have any Zulus or British colonial troops, but uh, that's another one that is on our uh, my to-do list for the year. That was one I was hoping to, another one I was kicking around, hoping to maybe possibly have the uh, have the armies ready to go for Huzzah, but there's no way in the world that's going to happen unless I, you know, quit my job or something like that. So that won't happen this year. But uh, yeah, no, that's a great set of rules. And that is... Uh, I mean, you talk about old school rules. Um, Sword and the Flame are old school rules. Um, I'll have to show them to you sometime. I can't believe I haven't given them to you to read already. Uh, but yeah, those are three solid picks, really solid picks. You just keep falling down on the job, don't you? I got a lot going on. Uh, okay, we'll go with that. Okay. I've lost my place in the list. Okay. Uh, Jay from the Veteran Wargamer podcast says, Stargrunt 2, not terribly well-known, models small unit actions very well, and has a very subtle morale system. Okay, this is another one i got to say that I'm not uh, I'm not familiar with. Stargrunt 2, do not know it. But again, I, I do tend to gravitate more so lately than before. But uh, towards small small scale stuff like squad and, and skirmish level type combat, so that sounds decent. Um, Star Ground, it's got to be a sci fi thing, but you're not wrong with that. But I do not know the game or the rules. According to Board Game Geek, it has a seven point four rating from nineteen ninety six. And the really neat thing about it is they claim it is available for free from GroundZeroGames.net. Oh. So that free alone is, makes it worth yeah. looking into. Yeah, free is a good price. It's probably one of my favorite prices other than <laughs> someone paying me. That's an even better price. Yeah. Two to four players, that's kind of cool. Because, I mean, it's it's hard to get really good two-player games sometimes. Especially if you're the other player. But yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Playing time for a couple hours. Just long enough without being too long. Pretty yep. neat. Artwork looks good. Nice images on there. Nice um, sheets with um, punch outs and stuff. Cool. Looks pretty neat. I got to say, I'm actually quite impressed by all of the things that people have suggested for games. Yeah. The things I, I mean, I never would have looked at most of these. Never would have heard of even half of them. And we're not even halfway through the list. But just such a wide variety of games. And they all seem to be just really good quality, interesting and innovative in different ways. Yeah. Richard happens to say March, March attack. That's not right. It's March attack. My notes are wrong. March attack. It's a Napoleonic game with easy to learn rules with a real historical feel. Yeah. Uh, that's one that again, I own. And if people don't know, I'm a bit of a rules junkie. I read them like other people read novels. I love collecting rules. Uh, the horror, <laughs> but, uh, no March attack. Uh, There's a laugh noted here. Everyone. That was a laugh. It was a laugh. That was a laugh. All right. Uh, so yeah, March Tech. Um, like I say, I've, I've got the rules. I've read through it 
I have not played it yet. Um, just reading, just reading them, which isn't really a great way to judge a game. Yeah, I would say what he says there is is it does it does seem easy to play. It seems like it would be easy to explain to somebody who's you know unfamiliar with Napoleonics or war gaming in general, and it it's. It feels like it would do a good job of simulating the Napoleonic style. So, yeah. That's actually high praise for you because you're very particular about rules, and especially when it comes to Napoleonics. I am. Um, March Attack gets gets ripped on. If you, re, if you read reviews of it, people kind of bang on it a little bit because it allows you to simulate huge battles uh, <laughs> without having a whole lot of figures on the table. And there are a lot of guys, and these are guys who, I guess, I don't know, live in mansions and all have eight by 10 foot gaming tables. Okay. Who are like, you know, part of the Napoleonic is the, the pomp and pageantry of the, of the armies on the table. And that's absolutely true. But if you don't have the room to do that, then what, what are you supposed to do? Just not game Napoleonics because you don't have the space for a gigantic table. Um, so... It, the, most of the criticisms I've seen leveled up March Attack, and this is kind of weird, but we're gamers are kind of real weird people in a way, but has a lot to do with the figure density on the table. Um, that wouldn't bother me. In fact, I look for ways to, even the games that we do have, like Black Powder or whatever that we play a lot, we're always looking for ways to reduce actually the size of the units because none of us have a whole lot of space. I mean, a six by four table is basically it for us. So, but. Um, yeah, March Attack. I I would uh, like to say haven't played it, have read it. Yeah, that seems like a that seems like a solid pick too. Cool. Okay, let's see. Max says interests. I would highly recommend any rule set by Two Fat Lardies, and I would uh, yeah, I would second that absolutely. Um, the rules of theirs that I've played. Uh, are I ain't been shot, Mum, which is company level World War Two. And uh, chain of command, which is um, level the skirmish level World War II, both really great sets of rules. They tend to focus on uh, leadership and the presence of leaders on the uh, on the table and getting your leaders to motivate and get your troops to do stuff um, more so than the uh, I don't know the hardware of war. I guess I would say uh, they're both really solid sets of rules. I would say. Of the company level sets that I've played so far, probably I ain't been shot. Mum is is up towards towards the top of uh, of rule sets that I'd recommend people start out with World War II company level and chain of command as well for uh, for skirmish level. It's uh, bold action is easier, and bold action is a great game. I like it, but I think it depends what you're looking for. Bold action is Hollywood World War II. Chain of command isn't. Chain of command is more. I hate to use the term realistic, but it it has a more uh, has a more realistic feel to it. A more, like I said, because it focuses on the leaders and trying to get the troops motivated to do what they need to do. I just think it's a better you know war game as opposed to just a game. Okay, I think that's fair. I I don't think anyone would, uh, you know, come with a pitchfork and torches to your home and be like how dare you say bolt action is a oh yeah you see you're wrong uh plenty of people would <laughs> you know as i said it i was like you know look at what i'm talking about <laughs> i mean we love gamers of all types sizes shapes interests everything but as you said we're an interesting group of people who have very strong passions and are not af afraid to share them yep, about any aspect of it yeah, and are extremely opinionated. And I, I'm no different. I try not to be a jerk about it. But yeah, I mean, that's just the way we are, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, no, the Lardies, I I don't think they have a bad set of rules that I've read or played. Um, we already had one on, um, I forget who mentioned it, but we had Sharp Practice listed. Mm -hmm. um, two other sets that I picked up that are kind of from the Lardies, not really, are um, Pickett's Charge and La Grande Armée. Uh, one obviously is Civil War. The other one is Napoleonic. Uh, just really great sets of rules. Um, but yeah, the Lardies, they've got a lot of really good stuff. They're doing their own podcast now, too. 
They are. I, I checked out the first episode, and I mean, we've talked about this before, and this is so stupid because here I sit on your podcast, but I'm not a big guy to listen to podcasts. There's a couple of like software development podcasts that I try to listen to, and I can't, and there's a couple of gaming podcasts that I tried to listen to, and that's easier, but I, I don't do it on a regular basis. I just, I don't know, not my thing. You got to find one or more than one that is about a topic that you like, and is in a format that you enjoy. I mean, a lot of people who listen listen to like true crime kind of stuff. Yeah. And I'm not really a true crime kind of guy, but I get sucked in every single time. I'm actually listening to a good historical one uh, right now, put on by the BBC World News Service. And it's about, and I can't remember her name, even though they mentioned it like half a million times, but it's about the assassination of the um, Pakistani prime minister. Uh, I can't remember her name. But it, she was killed, oh, geez, 10 years ago, I guess. And they never um, prosecuted anyone for it. And there were always allegations that it was like the Pakistani Taliban and that they had ties to the government or the military and all this. So they're doing like a deep dive into all that. And I'm actually also listening to a really good one on the Wondry Network called American History Tellers. And the first, I think, 10 episodes, they devote into the Cold War, just like every aspect of it. So doing deep dives on every um, episode. So the one I'm on right now, episode two, they're talking about propaganda. And so th while they talk about everything, I keep on thinking about Twilight Struggle. And, oh, yeah. I mean, great, just truly a great Cold War board game. Which is not my pick. It's not my pick for the list. I'm just saying. Um, so, like, they're talking about everything. And I'm just, I'm thinking about it and how the board game is using what they're talking about and bringing it in and, like, the use of propaganda and, um, you know, fighting through <laughs> representatives, basically, mm -hmm. other countries. And I learned where the term third world country comes from. And it does not have the negative connotation that it does nowadays. And, like, my mind was like, whoa, what the heck? That's brilliant. And, <laughs> It's because all these new countries that were forming in the 60s, in the uh, mid to late 60s, they didn't want to use communism. They didn't want to use just capitalism. They didn't think they were mutually exclusive. They felt there was a third way. that didn't have to be the first way, which was capitalism, or the second way, which was communism, that they could blend both in different degrees and be moderate and centrist. And how dare they think so? So that's how they came up with it. Therefore, they were referred to as third world countries. Yeah. They weren't just developing nations. I was like, wow, who knew? And that's what I, I think you can find a really good podcast and you can learn a lot of things. I don't disagree, but I don't know. They've never been my thing. It, it, I don't know. It's kind of odd. I don't understand it myself. It's really no different than listening to like a radio show or whatever, but uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, it's not for everyone. Apparently, for quite a few people, though. Yeah. So we okay. have more on our list, actually. We do. I think we're about halfway through now. Uh, I was quite amazed at the turnout because it, it was like <laughs> it was like four days before we were recording. Yeah. And I popped in line. I was like, "Who wants to share <laughs> something <laughs> that they want us to talk about on the show?" And Everybody. Like, oh. Yeah. I was like, "Wow, this is pretty good." So Ian happens to say, "Rapid Fire World War II." is his game that he would pick to share with another gamer. He says it is a fairly quick play set of rules, which can be easily adapted to suit most occasions. The scenario books give good games, which the forces are fairly historically accurate, which takes away a lot of the power gamer opportunities. Yay. That's me saying yay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think I've expressed my um, opinions on power gamers and turning gamers. And if those are things that you like, good on you. They do not bring me joy or happiness. And so I steer clear. And if you are one of those people, this might not be the game for you. But if you're someone like me, it sounds like it might be pretty good. Yeah. Rapid Fire World War II. I love a good World War II game. I really do. I do as well. Um, Rapid Fire, familiar with it. Never played it. And surprisingly, uh, don't own the rules. <gasps> yeah, I know. So I can't even comment intelligently on the rules. Shock and but, uh, horror. I know. I know. But uh, Wow. Yeah. You're batting like zero here, sports ball. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I agree. Anything that can kind of take the power gamer aspect out of a game, I'm all for it. 
that's good. It's, it really sounds mention a scenario books that it's story driven or um you know yeah. that's how we anything that we've ever really played we try to do and not a point spy even if it's a point spy system like bolt action for example because we're talking about world war ii uh we try to do some sort of scenario try to yeah um i mean not always but yeah i mean the point system is great because it's easy to, to pick up games and everything but it's yeah we don't need to talk about if you're looking for equitable play, points will not give you equitable play. And I will argue all day with anyone who says otherwise. Because <laughs> I'm taking a stand here, people. <laughs> the mindset is right. A thousand points or so a thousand points seems fair. Never mind the fact that war is not fair. I'm not going to talk about that. That's another episode. But the fact is, a 1,000 point tank, sci-fi tank, cover tank, whatever it is, versus a thousand point of infantry who don't have anything that can destroy a tank Equal points, not equal gameplay. Just saying. Okay. <laughs> I don't disagree. <laughs> oh, points. Uh, okay, moving on. We're going to get messages about that. I, I know. I just, I know it. Well, that's fine. I'm okay that's with fine. messages. I love constructive feedback and criticism. Yeah, and yeah. people's passionate thoughts. As long as they're well-reasoned and All right. enjoyable. So, Steve Wallet from Nerd Rage News, a word from a gamer documentary, and the Nerd Broadcasting Network says, first or second edition BTRC, uh, Time Lords, one of the best RPGs ever written. Then again, just about every game that every game that company has made has been, and it's gone. Pretty good. So, let me read that again, because that was a disaster. Steve Wallet <laughs> from Nerd Rage. <laughs> From Nerd Rage News, a word from a gamer documentary, and Nerd Broadcasting Network says, First Time Lords, one of the best RPGs ever written. Then again, just about every game that company has ever made has been pretty good. Um, and as an explanation to the listeners, I'm trying to look at our list of notes for the show and what people have written in in an app called Wonderlist. The problem with Wonderlist is it doesn't show you the whole note in one pane, so you got to close it, open the next one, and John needs to find a different app. Anyway, so you, before we move on, because no, 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 people are interested in behind the scenes kind of stuff. Okay, and so we can just throw it in here, Adrian. You don't have to open it up. You just keep the whole list in front of you. You don't have to like, click on each one and then go out and cl op click the next one. I've got it right here in front of me. You you just have the whole thing and they're all there. So like you don't have to like click on something and open something and then go to the next. One. It's just it's there. You just click okay. on the next one. It's pretty snazzy. Although Microsoft took them over, so. There we oh, go. Did they? Maybe they did. Cool. They're supposed to be shutting it down. So we'll find an alternative. That sounds about right. It's a popular Probably. app. Popular <laughs> app. People like it. Microsoft will kill it. Germans. <laughs> They're a German company. No, no, I know they are. That's yeah. Bundelist. Oh well. I think that's what you're supposed to say. I should know. But I think Wunderlist. For the and the name of the company was Wunderkind or Wunderkind, I think. And then they sold out. Just like Mojang. Thanks a lot. Terrible. I know. How dare they try to make money and be <laughs> successful and have happiness and joy at the same time. Uh, we hear Wargaming Recon do not support such activities. That's not true. God. BTRC no, no, no. Time Lords. Um, yeah, they have their whole Wikipedia article, actually. They did... Uh, they have a whole, like custom d20 system that they do mm. and they've changed things around stands for for those of you who might be curious quick trivia question i completely know this and i'm not looking at the wikipedia article of course which is in front of me um btrc stands for blacksburg tactical research center <coughs> time lords is a time travel role-playing game by mr greg border it sounds fascinating actually first came out in 1987 wow long time ago yeah, maybe we can get uh, maybe we can get Alex to run that for us, fit it in around our D and D sessions. I hope he sees this. <laughs> you are a mean, mean man. People think I'm the one who's not so nice. I'm not actually that mean. I'm not oh, the guy. I'm not oh, the guy. They that, don't know you. I'm not they, the guy. They do not know you at all, sir. I'm not the guy that said, yeah, we can do a D&D &D campaign. I'll be happy to run it. And then didn't. <laughs> you know, to be fair, though, 
Alex had, and we were going to get to this, but we'll get to it now. Alex had been told that we were doing this special 200th episode and it was going to come on. And I mean, it was a while ago we told him about it and he probably forgot. He's a very busy guy, family and so forth. No, yeah. And I had followed up with him this week before the recording and I said, hey, buddy, what is one game you want to share on the episode? Be thinking about it. He's like, so when are we doing it? And I told him, and he's like, oh, crud. And it's the only thing with his wife's side of the family that they got to do, and he couldn't get out of it. It was yeah. a done deal. Completely understand. But he's not here to defend himself. So <laughs> this is what, as I know from the time I was very sick with an upper respiratory virus, and you went on <laughs> the Mythwits, and you guys just all roasted me because I wasn't there. Yep. That's what happens, people. Decisions are made by those who show up. Exactly. If you're not going to be there. You get what's coming to you. Although next time he comes on, he can just fire back. That is true. Or dare I say it, rapid fire back? Ah. Oh. <laughs> Lame dad joke. That was just that was so terrible. It wasn't even punny. Um, John says, we the people, also known as George Washington's War, is his pick. The game is fun, not hard to learn, has a variety of game mechanics. It's card-driven, point-to-point movement, has tactile generals to move. Plus, you learn about history from the events. Geography, too. He has used it in small classes, so I'm going to presume he is perhaps a history teacher. And this has been on my list for a while because I've seen it pop up from time to time. Mm. I want to buy it. I want to play it. I've heard really good things about it. Yet another ringing endorsement. And... We should all know by now that I really do just love the American Revolution. Although I think it should have gone a different way. Yeah, you are kind of a Rev War guy, which makes it surprising that back in the day you were thinking about taking the the uh, the podcast in a World War II direction. Why would Doesn't you? Doesn't it? Yeah. I think at the time I was just like, I got a co-host. I don't have to do it all myself. Whatever you want, I will do. <laughs> I think that's what it may have been. Oh, my God. I'm just like, oh, yay. It's not just me anymore. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, let's see. Next, we have David says, good games for kids, period. <laughs> um, yeah. I, well, okay. <laughs> I'm laughing, not poking fun at, but because I know who this is. Oh. <laughs> he's an Iron GM. And he just says funny stuff like this. I mean, he's he's right, right? Like, I don't think anyone is going to disagree here. But he, it's just, he's, so, he's so to the point, but funny. And uh, I'll have to tell him when I see my total con. Oh it's good. Gosh. So he brings it up, but what do we think? Are, what do we think are some good games for kids? <laughs> I'm just, I'm loving this. This is wonderful. Uh-huh. Um, I think people pick things like Candyland. Or um, do you know what I would actually pick? And it's it's not a war game by any stretch of the imagination. Although I suppose you can mod it to be one. Apples to apples. Yeah. Great yeah. kid game. Great one adults would like. You can just do it with the whole family. Yeah. Or, and this one is kind of a war game, like very, very introductory level. Stratego. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Stratego is fun. If they've redone it. There's a Napoleonic one out now. Yeah. Uh, they have new stuff going all the time, new versions of it. I loved it as a kid. I got mine, I think, right next to my Hero Quest. I think is is what it is. Oh. And uh, I love Stratego. Great game. Yeah, I haven't played it in a while, but yeah, it's 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 fun. I remember it being fun. Um, I guess it depends on the age of the kid you're talking about. But uh, Risk is another one that I put mm-hmm. out there. Absolutely. Um, and for you know kids that are a little bit older, Carcassonne mm-hmm. and uh, Settlers of Catan are both. Uh, you know they're fairly easy. They're funny. They're they're. I don't want to compare them to chess because they're not that deep. But they're the the mechanics and the rules are easy. But the strategy is can be pretty complex. Um, but even so, I think those are are decent games to start kids on. Well, if the kid is old enough and they do like chess, they can always do Rogue Chess by um, Peter Bryan, who's been on the show. Yeah. Or and this is an old one. I think this is an Avalon Hill title. I think uh, Feudal. Yes. Are you familiar with that? I am. That was an old, old Avalon Hill title. I got it somewhere. Um, I got it one year for Christmas, I think. I wanted it, and one of my cousin's boyfriends ended up tracking it down somewhere. 
huh. and, um, was able to get it from my parents to give to me and it's probably at my parents' house is, is where with all my stuff because just by being married with a family of my own in my own house. Yeah, yeah. A lot of my games are at my parents' house. <laughs> I'm sure they well, want me to get them out of there. You know what? They, they probably do. Let me let me tell you a quick story about that. I, I some of my games were still at my folks' house and my mom after she got sick, um, I don't know, she went on a cleaning jag and uh threw a bunch of them away. Ooh. So my advice to you is anything you want, go get it. <laughs> I have a, I have more. I probably have enough Games Workshop stuff there in value that I could buy myself a Dwarven Forge castle in a custom wargaming table. I bet you do. Especially, I really do. No, I mean, like if it's in the box and not assembled or halfway painted or anything, yeah. A lot of it's still in box. A lot of it's unassembled. Uh, some of it might be assembled, but never painted, of course. Yeah. Vintage stuff. Uh, some Necromunda, Battlefleet Gothic, <laughs> older editions, Fantasy, 40K. Yeah, I got a lot of that. And Feudal, too, as well. So, yeah. Chaos War Mammoth, actually, from Fort World. That was uh, a big purchase for me one year. Oh. I was very excited about that. No doubt. Never oh. used it. Great model, though. Highly recommend should anyone be able to get anything by Forge World? Very, very expensive, but gorgeous pieces, really. Mm. It's not often I say nice things about Games Workshop or any of the companies. So this must be a very, very special episode. Very special episode. Very special. It's like one of those sitcoms that you know you watch as a kid, and they're like, on this very, very special episode of, I pick a favorite sitcom, I don't care. And it's like the kids on the show deal with like underage sex or smoking or using drugs or whatever. But like this is not any of those, but... Like they always build them as on this very special episode of Blossom, on this very special episode of Boy Meets World, whatever. That's what it is. And like all the marketing, it's just like they use that phrase. And I don't know why, but they do. Hmm. So and so does something that they've never done before on this very, very special episode of. Dun, dun, dun. And you tune in, it's exactly the same as every other episode. It is really, it's quite just, but. People fall for it. I fell for it, you know, numerous times. What the heck is wrong with us? I don't know what's wrong with you. I got theories. <laughs> I'm sure you, do. you could write a book. <laughs> That's how you're going to get rich. Duh. You write a book. Not about me because no one will buy it, but my mother will. <laughs> but, you, but you write a book. That's what you do. Your, your mom would definitely buy a book about you if I were to write it. Yes, yeah, she would. She would buy copies for all of her friends. <laughs> She'd buy like 10 copies just to keep it home. Just but, in case something were to happen to the other nine copies. Yes, but she would not necessarily want to read anything I had to say about you. I'm pretty positive about that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what's going to be another good game for kids, actually? Uh, and I'm going to get the wrong, name wrong because I always confuse which one is a card game and which one is a board game. But San Juan or Puerto Rico, whatever one is the correct name. You know, the yes. same game, but one's card and one's a... Yes. Or Bang. Uh, Bang would oh, be yeah. another go. Yeah, Bang is actually a lot of fun. Oh, and, well, no, Red Dragon Inn, I was going to say, but that really wouldn't be good for young kids. It's That's kind of... That's for teens. It's, yeah, it, it's just the mechanics are a little complex. I mean, they can be. But but yeah, I'll put it this way. Is... If the kid can play Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh, they can play Red Dragon Inn. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough. I would not ever recommend Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh! as a game for a kid, though, because they're just money sinks. Absolutely. I am not recommending but, um, those as well either. But No. I mean, it doesn't make them bad games if you're into that kind of thing, but yeah, God, it's total money sink. I think we just hit on another topic for an episode. Good games for kids. We have. Thank you, David. You helped us get a topic yeah. for a future episode. We will uh, send something special your way. And by sign, I mean probably give to you when I see you at TotalCon. <laughs> um, David D happens to say, quote, D and D, any edition except fourth, obviously. Why? <laughs> <laughs> hey, so <laughs> before we go back, fourth is the first edition of D and D I ever played. I played it for a year and a half in a campaign and loved it. Not saying I love the game, but it, I loved it, partly because of the people. But we all know, and if we don't, it's it's World of Warcraft in paper in pen and paper form, which is why it was nice and familiar for me. But <laughs> I love that. Except fourth, obviously. That's so bad. We just <laughs> he knows why 
he says, because it was the first. It started an industry. It helped millions of people come out of their shells, meet new people, forge new friendships, learn problem-solving skills, the importance of Ollie roll, always rolling the bodies. I didn't know you rolled bodies. I mean, I guess it's easier than carrying them. Does that that must mean something, right? In D and D, I'm a D and D noob, so I don't I don't get the rolling bodies note. Well, I think what he means is uh, looting. Oh. And I could be wrong about that. No, you are absolutely right. And if I had half a brain and was paying any attention, I would agree. Because of course you gotta you'd have to roll on the uh, loot table to see what you get. You've got to all the people. Yeah, you gotta loot the bodies. I mean, that's the whole point of the game. You're a murder hobo. <laughs> do you know though? A lot of people don't do it. They're just like, I slay this monster, I slay these goblins, I slay into something else. They're like on to the next thing that I then slay. And they so I'm a huge fan of Oots. And have you ever looked at it yet, Adrian? Because I've talked about it a fair bit. That what? Oots, Order of the Stick? No, I have not. Okay, so first of all, that's your homework. Forget it, your stuff for school, because that doesn't matter. That's your homework. Um, okay. for, but for those of you who are familiar, oh no, that's a running gag in the beginning. That like the this band of adventurers, they go out and they kill everything and they do stuff. But their thief, Healy is the one who's always like, wait, I got to loot the bodies. I got to loot the bodies. And what do I get for looting this rock? And what do I get for looting this? And so they do for comedic effect. But like, really, that's how you amass your fortune is by looting everything. That's what we need to inject in a set of wargaming roles. You destroy this regiment. And what do you do when you capture them? You loot them. You should be able to get stuff to loot them and use for the next battle. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be incorporating that into any of the games that I run. Do you know what, though? So the, there was a game I talked about last time. You weren't on the episode, uh, which is a shame. But I told you it's a game that you need to buy. And it is Ultimate General Civil War. And you loot people in that. Yeah. So it, it, at the end of a battle, especially if you're doing a campaign, it gives you this rundown of like how you did and like what generals got promoted or died or wounded or whatever. And one of the things is it lists equipment that you captured, that you looted from the enemy, or that you saved, that like your guys are running away, and you're like, oh no, we gotta get out of it, and you, they drop their weapons, but that like you manage to go and loot your own weapons back, and so then you use them to equip your, your forces when you raise raise new regiments or brigades or whatever. Huh. I, I, it makes sense to me, I like it, and I tell you, I've had many a time where I'm trying to outfit a regiment, and I don't have enough rifles for them. I get the guys, I get the money, but suddenly I'm World War II Soviets, and I'm like. One rifle per 10 guys. <laughs> Share. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. No, that's a bummer. It is. But looting makes it better. You just got to loot that stuff. Mm. That should be a house rule. <laughs> I'll figure out a way to put it in. The guys are going to hate if I tried to do that. You guys would smack me. I'm going to make a banner and put it on my desk at work. Looting makes it better. <laughs> you should do that. That'd be pretty good. <laughs> uh that's good stuff. Um, so I think that's all the stuff we have from listeners. Uh, yeah, it is. Yep, we got them all. Well, I want to thank everyone for your very good suggestions. There's a lot of interesting stuff there, and I'm excited to try a bunch of them, actually. Uh, how about you, Adrian? Any favorites that stand out from there? All the Lardy stuff, definitely. Mm -hmm. yep, definitely all the Lardy stuff. Um, Regimental Fire and Fury, like I said, that's a, that's a favorite of mine. Um, and uh, rapid fire is one that we should that one we should give a try. All we need are the rules. We've got all the stuff we need. Cool. I like that. But um, yeah. I think I'm going to choose any of them where I can loot people. Okay. Oh, things. I mean, you don't want to waste. We're all about being green here. Reusing, recycling, repurposing. Indeed. So it's just the, the right way to be conscious and savvy and um, caring about the environment in which we live. Gotta loot the bodies. I love that. And, and I'm a moron. It didn't even come to me rolling the bodies. I was like, rolling the bodies? What the heck? I spent all day trying to figure out what he meant by it. But it's clear as day. It really is. <laughs> oh, it's a good I, thing. It's a good thing I was here. It's always a good thing that you're here. 
I think you need to share what one game you would share with a gamer and why. Okay, I didn't uh, I didn't give it to you ahead of time because I, I, I wanted I wanted to see if you could guess what it is. Oh God, you're not gonna make me guess. You really should just know. I should just know, but I'm not even gonna guess because I know I'm gonna get it wrong. And then Advanced. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna be like, "Why, well, yes, of course it's that." Okay, Advanced Squad Leader. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, it's for a particular audience. If you're not interested in World War II, it's not going to appeal to you. Um, and if you play full Advanced Squad, you know the full the full set of rules. The full the rule book is like that thick. If you include all the modules and everything, it's got a rule for just about any ridiculous situation you can think of. Um, but it, it's a very, very good simulation of small scale, uh, world war two infantry, primarily infantry. I mean, there's, there's vehicles in it and everything, of course, as well, but primarily infantry combat it is just from the original squad leader published by Avalon Hill and God, when did that come out? 79, 80. I'm not even sure. Before I was born. Um, yeah. Uh, and from the advanced squad or from the squad leader series, it morphed into advanced squad leader. And now there's just an infinite variety of modules and, and all kinds of stuff available for it. But that's the game that I would recommend. Now, the problem with that game, aside from the subject matter, like I said, if you're not interested in World War II, obviously you're not going to, it's not going to be interesting to you. The problem with it is the complexity. It's extraordinarily complex. So it's difficult to teach somebody who's not familiar with uh, war games. Uh, but the publisher, the primary publisher of it is a, uh, group called multi-man publishing and they also publish what are called starter kits or so get three different starter kits or starter kit one two and three and they step you incrementally through the different uh different portions of the game so starter kit number one is just strictly infantry combat and like the first scenario that you play in starter kit one is just infantry it's just guys they don't even have support weapons no machine guns and then the scenarios ramp up in complexity and the stuff that they add and then starter kit number two adds artillery and onboard artillery like uh, guns anti-tank guns mortars things like that and then starter kit number three is the, the the whole shebang and it adds in vehicles tanks all the core components of the game but even at that you don't have all of the rules in the starter kits. It's just the bare minimum of what's needed to introduce you to the mechanics and how things go so that you can get a feel for the game system. A lot of people never go beyond the starter kits, and that's fine. But if you play the starter kits and if you get them down, then transitioning into the full rule set is actually very easy because it just adds different components onto what you already know. Um, vehicle hit locations, things like that, that aren't necessarily covered in the starter kit. So, but the game is, I hate to say completely comprehensive, that's not true, but it really is a comprehensive um, study or treatment of small scale World War II combat. Um, and if you wanted to get somebody into wargaming in a big way, and they were, uh, they were seriously interested in that particular topic, ASL is hands down the best game to do it with, in my opinion. Now, if memory serves me right, this made it onto your holiday gift guide 2017 list as something you thought people should pick up for the holidays. Uh, yeah, the starter kit did, I think, yeah. Starter kit one and two, maybe? Yeah, or all three. I mean, they go in and out of print. That's the problem with these small publishers. You kind of got to keep your eye on them. Hmm. But, um, but yeah, any one of the starter kits, because they all contain... Like if you get starter kit number two, but don't have one, it's okay because kit two has the infantry. So it's, but uh, yeah, they go in and out of print. So they were, they were definitely on my, on my holiday list for the, uh, whatever it was, $25 range or whatever, because they're not expensive. People should check out that episode. We actually had a lot of really good stuff in there. I think all of the guys, except for one who I'm not going to name, who, couldn't make it to today's episode. Uh, all of the other guys, though, no matter where they were in the world, submitted items for the list. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Alex. <laughs> well, the thing with Alex is he was probably busy working on planning out the D&D campaign. <laughs> You're just not lit enough. Poor Alex. Yeah, poor Alex. Mike Payne put stuff on. He's not even on the show anymore. Yep. 
Joshua put stuff on all the way down from down under. Jamie all the way over from Norway had stuff in there. You had stuff. I had stuff. Mm. It would have been nice if Alex had something. He could have sent it, you know, beforehand, and then we would have put it in. It would have like this episode. Indeed, we got his pick. Actually, his one game that he would share with other people, and he happens to say, "quote I won't be there for the recording. Sadly, obligations." My game is probably no surprise. It was not a surprise to me. I was hoping he was going to pick something else. Not a surprise to me, but he says, Song of Blades and Heroes. Reason, learning that rule set means you have learned the rules to other games by Ganesha in various periods and settings. One size fits almost all. Unquote. Yeah, that's actually a pretty solid pick for the reasons he lists. Um, no, definitely. And I think it's a pretty affordable game, too. Yeah, very affordable, actually, I think. I, I don't think any of the, the printed rules are... Uh, I don't think any of them are over $20. I don't think so. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like... So Song of Blades and Heroes is a... People that don't know it, it's a skirmish-level fantasy game. Um, very small units, so you don't need a lot of figures to start playing. Um, I'm not even sure. 10 per side, maybe? Maybe a few more. But you don't need a lot of figures to start playing. And they have... Uh, essentially the same core rule system uh, adapted to other uh, time periods like French and Indian War skirmish. All, any time period you can think of, I think they probably have a, a specialized set of rules to uh, to cover it. What are you doing? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. It's something you want to say. You, you were explaining to us about the value of this core set that works for a variety of different periods and times and whether you like fantasy or no matter what genre it is and how affordable it is and how good it is and why it's a great pick that Alex made it. I'm agreeing with you. Okay, good. Cause yeah, it is. It, yeah, it's a solid pick. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't really sure what he would submit, but that was, that was dumb to not be sure. Now that I've said it, cause it was definitely going to be that. Just um, like your ASL. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. makes perfect sense actually. Yep. So what's your number one game, John? Well, People should know by now, I don't just pick one game. I never have. And I, I make the rules so I can break them. I, I did list one game that I'm sure you saw. Yep. But that was a little bit of misdirection. Uh, indeed. Probably because it's what I do. So I actually have three <laughs> that I want to list. And they're different games and different types of games. And they kind of cover a variety of platforms. I'm going to refer to them as. Okay. So we've talked a lot about physical games that you play, whether they're war games or board games or card games or, or party games or whatever, uh, things that you would sit down at a table with people and play in person. And my first one is not any of those things. It's a computer game. Uh, I know we don't really talk about computer games a whole lot of, or any sort of electronic gaming, but from time to time we do. And I actually get to play most of my games by playing on the computer. I play during my lunchtime. So I play things like World of Warcraft, which is not my pick, although great game. Uh, just kind of hard to share with someone else. I'm actually going to suggest a game that you can get on Steam. So you can actually buy it. You could gift it to someone. You can't share per se, but you could gift it or allow them to use your machine or whatever. And it's not a war game at all, although I have quite a few on Steam that I could put for my pick. But it's a really good simulation that allows you to think about logistics, which I think is very important for people when you translate into like a board game or any sort of tabletop war game. And it's called Prison Architect. I've talked about this on the show before, yeah. and it's a big favorite of mine. Made by Introversion, they're a British company. They've done Uplink, which was a really good game about hacking computers, and Darwinia, which didn't do as well, but a very interesting game about AI. And Prison Architect is a simulation game, so think something like any of those city builders, like SimCity or, or whatever. But instead of building a city, you build a prison, and you get prisoners who come in, and you get different security levels of them. You can have uh, a prison for men, you can have a prison for women, which has its own challenges. They have different sets of needs, but you have to balance it all by hiring your workforce of security personnel, of a psychiatrist. You have to choose like how I'm going to use the term for political speak of liberal conservative. You want your prison to be like how um, harsh do you want the punishments to be? Are you really about um, 
punishing them? Are you really about rehabbing the prisoners? How are you going to handle all that? What's your position on death penalties, uh, which come into it? But then also, how do you handle the logistics of it all? Because you have to make money because it's a private prison. So you have to stay afloat with that. But you have to balance it against the security issues of things being smuggled in. And yet you also have to be able to feed all the people. You have to feed your employees. You have to have enough electricity and water. But you have to do it in such a way, so that, again, that it's safe. You don't want people to be tunneling out. You don't want people to be escaping. And you might want guard towers with snipers. And they have all these different things, a lot of systems. And Adrian, you as a computer programmer, would really appreciate it because they make a lot of this available in an accessible way for people, but available to the end user. Uh, and one thing that you can do, a lot of prisons happen to have things like automatic doors. So you can have like logic circuits in here, you can have things set up with door timers or like if then statement kind of stuff. And for those of you who don't understand any of this, it's all graphical. So you just kind of drag and drop and you do. It's a lot of fun to play. But it gets your mind thinking about things in a different way instead of just being like, I need the most money. I need the best this or the newest that. You really have to think about proper placement of stuff with the ideal location for it in a prison. What's would be the ideal for your units on the tabletop? Uh, how are you going to supply all your units on the tabletop? How are you going to supply your employees and your prisoners with everything? And what's the optimal way to do it and the best routes for everyone to go? And how can you speed things up and so forth? So I think it really does translate into the whole supply side and the logistical side of warfare and gets you thinking in a different kind of way and it's not a war game at all but like it just it, it goes into that so well and i think you can also just kind of think of it as a, a way to think defensively too so that you have this prison you want to keep everyone inside you want it to be safe and secure so you could put that on the tabletop whether you have a dwarf forge castle or you're building <laughs> <laughs> anything else you have your encampment and your trenches you have your uh forest that you try to do like how are you going to make your area secure and yeah. give yourself the best defensive bonuses or any onslaught you are inflicting or being inflicted upon you when you're on the tabletop it's a wonderful game i can't really just can't recommend it enough it's probably one of my favorite games i've ever played huh. so it's really up there i, I highly recommend it it's on sale. Steam is cross-platform, so no matter what type of computer you have, you can do, and they even have stuff so that you can play not directly on your computer. It'll play on your computer, but you can play on your, on your TV screen. You buy a, a remote control from them that looks like a video game control in a special little box, and those are actually pretty cheap right now, too. You can sit down on your couch, play on your big screen, and it just kind of runs from the computer and just goes through your Wi-Fi and right onto the TV. So I think it's a win. Now, if you don't like computer games and adrian i know you do uh does this sound like a game you would play yeah it does actually i love the city the uh, city building games so it, you really get to look into it i think i've spent over three or four hundred hours on this game <laughs> I, I just i play all the time think of how much better the show would be if you devoted that 400 hours <laughs> well there's, you know there's that thing where they say you're not truly good at something until you've done over 300 hours of it Hmm. whether it's art or writing or whatever and there's 200 episodes here right yeah <laughs> so you figure each episode is let's say an hour they average out roughly right so let's say an hour and a half <laughs> average out you can make my math hard all right say an hour uh, so that's <laughs> not hard but more difficult than i wanted it to be uh so that's 200 hours of running time and then if you figure that and people don't know this but generally for a podcast in order to get it uh, to be ready for you, the listener, to hear, you double the running time of an episode. And that covers all the editing, that covers uh, writing show notes, and like that immediate kind of stuff. It doesn't cover all the other things that we do. So you double that, and that gives you the finished podcast episode. So one hour is actually two. So you get 400 hours worth of work put in, and then you do all the other stuff. So you're probably talking five, 600 hours worth of stuff at least for the show for 200 episodes but if you want to do your hour and a half then <laughs> there you go. that's even worse <laughs> so by now would hope halfway decent yeah. i think right i don't think that's being full of myself i, I think we're halfway decent here but, yeah we try yeah prison architect highly recommend if you want a board game the one that kind of you know helps you soothe that itch you have for miniatures play 
or a more war game feel. 1775. Great game. Excellent game. I don't know if I would say that would scratch anyone's miniatures itch, though. A little. So the thing is, and this is why I say I think it scratches it a little bit, is that most people who play it seriously do not use the wooden cubes that the game comes with. They instead buy miniatures, paint them, and put them on to represent the armies. Yeah, you could definitely do that, and that would make it more visually appealing. It still wouldn't give it a miniatures feel, though, is kind of what I was thinking. But uh... when, Definitely not the same as any of the minis games we mentioned, but like starts going towards that way a little bit, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, that is a great game, though. I really enjoy that. Highly recommend it. We've talked about it a lot, so I don't want to beat the horse there. But yeah. again, Rev War, so it's a win there. You, it always comes down to the end. No matter how well you play, you really have to play even better. It's not a matter of luck. I mean, a little bit, but it's not one of those games that no matter what you do, it's just it's the luck of the dice or whatever. You really have to think strategically. You have to think tactically. You have to worry about where your flanks are exposed. You have to think on the grander scale and not just like focus on one area, which I is always my downfall in the game because I'm like, this area here is really cool. I really want to get this. I want to stop whatever happened. Meanwhile, somewhere in one of the other colonies, I should be focusing and doing whatever. So you, you really have to look at the larger picture. And I could see this being used as a map if someone wanted to for a campaign and then actually fighting the battle, individual battles. Instead of rolling dice, you, you would fight them with your models on the tabletop or doing yeah. some sort of hybrid like that. Yeah, yeah, I think you could do that. It's affordable. It's on Amazon. We'll have an affiliate link, I'm sure, in the show notes. So you can get it just about anywhere. And very well done. Game by Academy Games. Highly yeah. recommend. Good teaching tool, too, if you want to do the whole history side of things. I still don't quite have a grip on how the Native Americans are useful because they're just they're out there. So you have to make an effort to go out there. And if you don't make that effort, they just sit there all game. Well, that's that's what makes them useful, though. I mean, if, if you go out and, and round them up and collect them and add them to your army basically for free... I mean, we never do that. The thing is, they're the, the Indian forces are located in kind of out of the way places, mm -hmm. and it's like you always go whole hog into into New England, and you know sometimes in South Carolina and whatnot. Yeah, but never out in the hinterlands of New York or Pennsylvania, where the where the Indian forces are. But they're they're extremely useful if you get a hold of them, though. Well, I mean, if you get them, but at least in our playing. We don't really make an effort to go out there because we're like, well, we got to send a Cuban, an army of whatever out there to get. And then you get to stop. You can't pick them up along the way. So you get to stop. And then like next turn, you'd have to then move them into something else and do an attack. And we tend to well, concentrate on along the coast is really what it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to, you got to decide what you're going to do with it. Cause that, that's the one thing we said, we weren't going to talk about this game a lot. And here we go. But, um, <laughs> On this you very special of, episode of what you really yeah. got. You, you know, you got to decide on what you're going to, what your strategy is going to be. Because the, one of the things that makes the game great and very replayable is the, the cards yeah. um, give it a random nature. So you can't move all of your troops every turn. So you got to decide, you know, what's important, what I want to do. So that, you know, depending on how your, uh, how your movement cards fall out, it can be either very easy or very difficult to go out and collect the Indian forces, but you just have to decide if that's what you really want to do or not. It's probably worth doing. I We usually don't, but um, yeah, anyway, that's enough about 1775. No, you might be right. You might be right. And I do think that the um, uncertainty of what you can do in a turn feels very authentic to me. Oh, yeah, you I definitely. Like yeah, I love not being it. Well, I shouldn't say I love it, but it's. it's... <laughs> you appreciate it? I appreciate not being able to move all of your troops as far as you want to every turn, which sometimes board games will let you do that. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily as far as you want to move them, but you can move everything. It's um, very pandemic of them. Yeah. yeah, So pandemic, also not my other pick. So my final pick is a minis game a set of rules made by people who used to work at games workshop who knew even then, that they really have a love of historical gaming, historical war gaming, and that many of them have large collections of painted figures that look beautiful and that they should play and should write down the way they play. And I'm sure many of us have been like, you know, if we write this down, other people are going to want to play games the way we play games. Well, these people actually did it. 
and they produced and published and manufactured this whole set and then created more miniatures for it so that you and I can buy and got their friends at Warlord Games to put it out because Warlord Games is owned and staffed by people who used to work at Games Workshop who love historical games. I'm referring to Black Powder. And by referring to Black Powder, I'm actually also including all of the things that came off of Black Powder. So everything like Hail Caesar and Last Argument of Kings and Titan Black Powder. Shot. Yeah, yeah any, any, all of them. Yeah. And one of the things that I really like about it is that, and this is one thing people who dislike it, dislike it for, but it covers such a large swath of time. So basically from the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve were like, hey, what's going on here? Let's eat this apple. Uh, all the way to now, uh, you can play, well, 1920s, right? 1920s, 1930s, maybe. Um, 1900s. You, be pre World War II, you can, um, well, the Mahdi, right? That's as far as it goes, right? Yeah. Thomas Wars in Sudan. Um, you can play anything with one rule book. You don't have to get other rule books. So, of course, it's a little generalized in that, but they say up front, unlike most games, that they want you to modify it. They want you to use your own house rules, things that make it more enjoyable for you and that you shouldn't get bogged down in the minutia of it. You should always go with what will create a friendlier, more fun game. doesn't matter yeah. what it specifically says. So right there, you, you, you get rid of, in my mind, power gamers, turning gamers, uh, all that kind of stuff. People who are going to be like, well, it says here, but there's a comma. So that means the meaning is this. Whereas if there was a semicolon, <laughs> It would be, and if, again, if that's your thing, that's great. It's not mine, which is why this is my pick. <laughs> uh, but so you, you get a whole lot of playability out of it. You can do anything. And, and if you group Hail Caesar in, as I'm going to, you can use Ancients. I like Ancients, Ancient Rome. Wonderful, right? So you can go all the way back there to current. You can, and I know it's intended for large armies, right? But as you said, Adrian, we're always trying to find ways to reduce the model count. Yeah. Just because it, I mean, it's easier. And I think a lot of people who game, they don't have the space, they don't have the time. And people think, oh, I need a lot of models, so I'm not going to do black powder. You can do black powder. You can have fun with black powder. You can do it without having a gazillion models on the table. We've done it. It works. Yep, works fine. And the games still look really good. I mean, obviously, they, they look amazing if you have like a gazillion models on the table. But even if you don't, they still look good games. You get these beautiful looking games. You can run them at game days. You can run them at conventions. And you can do all of this. You could do turning games if you want. I mean, it has a whole point system and they, they put it in because people said you need a point system. And they're like, we don't want a point system, but they put it in because people want the point system. And you can do all of that. You can do pickup games. You can do just what, anything that you want with this. And it's a really good way to take a dive into historical wargaming because I think a lot of people who dive into historicals come from a background of sci-fi fantasy games whether it's uh warmer hordes whether it's a gw product uh D, &D any of that kind of stuff you're used to those closed cultures where everything you need is provided by the company and historicals is not like that at all but the closest you come i think really would be warlord i used to say battlefront but i think warlord even more so now. And they have a much larger ecosystem. And whether you want to do like a World War II thing, like bolt action, again, it's all there. So anything you need, they have it's branded, it's easy to find, easy to get into. So yeah. if like me, you were clueless about it, but you wanted to do it all, I think it's really the way to go. Yeah, it definitely is. And they are more and more becoming a one-stop shopping place. And the products that they offer are really high quality. But the important thing to note is, that unlike those, you know, closed systems all under one roof. You don't have to use their stuff. You can get your minis from anywhere. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. It's just, if you're just getting, it's just, you know, if, I mean, a lot of cases you're going to want to use their stuff because it's so good. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It is. I mean, it, you know, I'm not, uh, they're not paying me to say that. It's just what I think. It's, it's good quality stuff. They should be paying us to say it though, even though it is oh. the truth. <laughs> Warlord. <laughs> I know some people who work at Warlord listen to this. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. So How gorgeous yeah, the stuff is and you want to use the models. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't have to if you don't want to. Like, you know, if you're playing, not to pick on a particular game system or anything, but, you know, 40K, 
you get your stuff from Games Workshop, it, and that's that's all there is to it. Uh, historicals aren't that way, but uh, yeah, Warlord is is becoming, um, like I said, the one stop shopping at least for the games that they offer, and that's fine. Um, you know, it makes it easy for people. You don't have to go there if you don't want to, but in a lot of cases, it'd be a mistake not to. I agree with you. One of the things that I do really like about them is that even if you were to play in, I don't know, a bolt action tournament, you are not required to use the company paints. And if you don't, heaven forbid, your painting score will suffer. Unlike other companies I won't name, where you have to use their paints and you have to have at least three co different colors of their paints on there with their models. And only a certain percentage of the model can be converted from non their brand models or yeah. their brand stuff. There's none of that with Warlord. And I know people are afraid that because as Warlord becomes more successful and more mainstream, people are some people are concerned anyway that they might be going the way of this other company that I'm not going to bash because I bash them all the time. Well, uh, I hope, yeah, I, I don't mean, think I, they will. I really don't, but I know I don't they're either. concerned. Yeah, I mean, and I understand why they're concerned. I don't think they'll go that way. I hope they don't. I if I mean, if they do, that'll probably be a parting of the ways for me because I have no tolerance for that. I can't see them doing that, though. I mean, why? Yeah. Me neither. If nothing else, just from a practical reason, they don't have their own paint. The closest you come is... I mean, they don't. Okay, so let's pretend that they wanted to, right? Let's pretend they were like, we need okay. to do it to get as much money as possible because we see how successful these other people are. So that's what we're going to do. Let's say that they wanted to do it, and I don't think they do. But let's say that they did. If nothing else, they don't have Warlord paint. They don't right, have well, their brand. The closest is Army Painter, which is an independent company, and the next closest would be Vallejo, also independent. And Vallejo being Spanish, they're not going to sell out to them. They just... I mean, unless the money was really good, and Warlord can't do that. So, I don't. I don't think there's any worries about them going that route. No, I, I can't say it. I've been wrong before, once or twice, but I, I don't think I'm wrong about this. Yeah. No. Anyway, I throw Warlord a lot of my money. I'll say that. So. Mm hmm. And I'm all. I'm staring at a pile of bolt action stuff, and it all says Warlord on it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Uh, yep. They are worth it, in my opinion. Kits look good, good prices, nice combination of materials. You get just about anything you want. Well done. Cracking company. I like them. All right. So I think those are all the games we wanted to share. I believe. We do have a few odds and ends that people might be interested in. So I happened to get some new gear. And uh one of the things we've talked about in the past is that we've had some issues with YouTube <laughs> and recording and sharing our videos on their video stream. And one of the things that we're trying to do is expand away from that. So we're not restricted to one platform for stuff. And also so that we can create video content and more audio content on the go, whether we're at a convention like total Con by we, I mean me, uh, we'll get to that in a minute or, um, we're at a game day or we're just playing ourselves. And I had wanted to get a digital camera or a camcorder to do video. But then I realized I get an iPhone. And iPhone has a really good camera. I can do HD. I can do 1080p. I can do 4K, <laughs> which is kind of funny. And you would need some stuff. So I've shared some of the stuff I've got before. But I got a cool thing. Just came in actually by Aki. It's a lens. It came in this really cool case. So if you're watching the live stream, and if you weren't, you should. Because live stream is fun. You get to see the funny things that don't make it into the episode. Because with this cool case to protect it, it's a nice hard shell. And I picked up two lenses, actually. It's a 0.45x wide angle, which is not going to mean anything to anyone. But Adrian, it means something to you, doesn't it? I, I think it'll mean something to most people. You think? Because yeah. I'm not sure most people are camera people. So it's a, But for those who aren't, it's a wide angle lens. And I got one before but it was slightly wider than this one. And both were recommended for the kind of stuff that we want to do. The one that was slightly wider angle almost creates a fisheye look, depending on how it's placed. It clips onto your smartphone. And if you don't have it just right, you kind of get a little fisheye, especially if you pull it back from the subject. So like if, you know, we were like normal speaking distance from one another uh, and you picture the camera that way, it's going to be fine. 
you said five, six feet back, right? And, and trying to use this to take images, photos, or whatever of a game table it might look a little weird. So the new lens doesn't do that. And the new lens also comes with a 15x macro lens. So the other one came with a 10x. And uh, I know Joshua will have edited that out. But the 15x is really cool because you can get nice and close to subjects like models. It's something that's going to be really small. And get it right on the camera. And you get a nice clear shot. And I've always had trouble getting great images of models when I take pictures or video or any of that kind of stuff. So this will help with that. And I'm pretty excited about it. And uh, I think it's going to create some good content for people. Good. Um, on top of that, anyone who sees the video that we'll have on our video streams will have seen at one point <laughs> when Adrian was like, what are you doing? Um, I was playing with this new mic stand I got. So it attaches to a table and it's a, they call it a boom arm, but it kind of like hangs out over and anything you've ever seen with like professional audio people are doing stuff. They have something like this. So I got it for Christmas. They're just repositioning it. It's important to point out at this at this juncture that what we do is very different from what professional audio people do. Speak for yourself, sir, with your headset. <laughs> I am using professional gear here. <laughs> yeah, we're not. I mean, it's. I am not in a soundproof location. I am not. I would like to be, but I don't have that kind of money. Uh, you do the best you do. But this is something that ups the game, increases quality, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we do have some announcements, though, about things that are coming up. There's a convention coming, Total Con. Very excited yeah. about it. Yep, we have some news, though. That. Do you we want to share the news we have? News. I will share the news. It's a long, sad story. The theme for Total Con this year, for people that don't know, is going to be pirates. And so we thought, hey, we got this great pirate game from Firelock Games called Blood and Plunder. We should run Blood and Plunder at TotalCon. So, okay, we decided we would do that. And when we decided we're going to run a game like that, if it's something that we don't already have the, the figures and, and whatnot for, what that translates into, Adrian has a crap load of figures he's got to paint. So... Started doing that, bought all the stuff that we needed, um, got off to a really good start, got a lot of English guys done, got some Spanish guys done. But unfortunately, my life is uh, a mess in terms of being busy and everything. And so, long story short, we're not going to be running Blood and Plunder at, uh, at Total Con. So that was, that was actually a big disappointment. So... Late in the game, I decided, I, I told John, I said, look, there's absolutely no way I'm going to get this stuff done. Um, and he said, well, you know, that kind of sucks, but why don't we, why don't we run bold action? We, you know, we've got everything we need to do a bold action game. We come up with something to do that. I was like, okay, yeah, that's a great idea. So I email, emailed the miniatures coordinator at, uh, at Total Con. And this is another thing that I'm not very good at is pre-planning and keeping track of what's going on with stuff. I emailed him two weeks late to change the event. And his response basically was, you know, it's too late. I can't change the event. You either have to do it or cancel. I was like, all right, cancel it. That's the only option, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, no blood and plunder at total con, the pirates themed total con, which is a huge disappointment for us. Um, there is still going to be a, a board game there. We think, uh, that we're going to run called uh, new Bedford. And actually when I say we're going to run it, what I mean is if it happens, John is going to be running it on his own because part of my life that's all messed up is work. And they, they told me, they sprang on me kind of the last minute saying, Hey, you're going to have to go to Wisconsin at the end of February. They, they gave me the dates and it's like, yeah, that might be a problem for, for the con, but I think I can work around it. But the problem is I misunderstood them with the dates. And I also misunderstood every, every year about this time, my cousin and I take a trip down to Texas and normally it's at the end of February, first week of March, except this year, they pushed the date for this trip back to, um, the 23rd of February, which if you're familiar with the dates for total con, it's right around that time. So basically I'm going to be in Texas when total con is going on and I can't, not only can I not run blood, blood and plunder, I can't go to Total Con at all. 
And so the upshot of that is if there's going to be a Wargaming Recon sponsored game, it's going to be a board game called New Bedford. Jonathan is going to be running it. And I spent, I won't even tell you how much money on blood and plunder stuff that I now don't need. So that's the total con update. What do you got? So there's something about this that just it makes me laugh because is it all the money I spent? Is that what you <laughs> make? No, I, I'm used to getting you to spend money on stuff. Although you got yourself to spend money on that. Well, no, yeah. There's irony here, really, because for the past few years, people I won't name anyone, but people have been giving me a hard time about the fact that. For what we do when we go to conventions is I'm the one who leases with the con. I do all the organizing. I do all the pre-planning, all the things that you mentioned that you don't particularly like or, or don't think you're very good at. I'm not saying you're not good at them. I, I would agree that you probably don't really like them, but all that kind of stuff. And as such, by doing all the submissions and everything, I get listed as the GM for it, as the one who's running it. And so it's like such and such game being run by Jonathan Reinhardt and so forth, where... <laughs> I'm laughing, but where you'd be the one who's slaving away painting it and stuff. Cause I'd be like, I'm doing all the stuff. You're doing the painting, whatever. And so this year we're like, this year's going to be different this year, <laughs> this, this year, I won't be doing any of you planning. You get to do that. That way you make sure you get the credit, you get your name on it. It'll all work right. And we'll, we'll kind of sort of swap roles where, or basically I'll step back and you get to, to, to be the one you get to be in the spotlight and do all of it. <laughs> And I'm not saying there's a correlation between the two. I'm really not. But like, as luck would have it, when you're doing that, everything hits the fan. Yep. <laughs> and that's came completely apart. It, it oh, just, well. it makes me laugh. It really, it really does. I mean, it's awful. It, it, don't get me wrong. It is awful. And I know people will miss you. And... I am pretty disappointed. I won't even get to see the screening of uh, oh, the no! documentary. I'm well, going to miss it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will um, I will watch and look for... Let me know if my horrible <laughs> mistake made it into the final cut. And what horrible mistake would that be? I'm not saying anything, because if it didn't make it in, nobody needs to know. But if it <laughs> does make it in, we'll explain it away in the episode following the con. Oh, oh you're not even going to be on the crossover I'm episode. I'm not even going to be there for the crossover episode. This is, this is horrible, oh, but it is your chance for revenge for the episode I was on Mythwits and you were not. So oh, geez. yeah, it's <laughs> every, this was like going to be the best total con of the last, however many years. It, really it, was. All, went, it all went straight into the crapper. Oh, completely man. ruined. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be partying by myself. Jeez. Wait, I'm going to be partying by myself. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is too crazy. Yeah, it totally sucks. The crossover episode I miss. I miss the screening of the movie. It's you don't the amount get to of see yourself on film. You're gonna have to buy a DVD of it if only you backed it on. Did you back it on the Kickstarter? I did back it on the Kickstarter. Yeah. Oh, so I mean, you get a copy that way. Yeah, we yeah we, that, but that's not the same as screening it with everybody and. Eh. You know, that's... Gonna be the... <gasps> you're gonna miss out on the Indian place. I know. I I, I, I don't know. even remember the name, but they were amazing wow yeah i don't know so pretty pretty crappy year i i'm just at this point i'm hoping that Hazad doesn't get screwed up too <laughs> well man, it's a long way away there's still time plenty of time for stuff to go wrong and, and then havoc maybe 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 you can make it up by uh by going havoc. oh god yeah we'll just see how many get messed up uh so anyway <laughs> wow that's um yeah that's rough it's bad it's <laughs> that bad. is bad well i'm sure people are gonna be sad that you won't be at the convention it, it's a shame you're gonna miss it but geez yeah wow, it was it. i know it was gonna be so good this year but oh well it really was well um speaking of conventions though it's not us just to say that up front but I happen to know that there's going to be a very special guest making uh, an appearance at Enfilade this year. I think it's Memorial Day weekend, I believe. And uh, things are just being finalized, so I can't say their names. But I can say that they've been 
at least one of them have been on the show. We've talked about them and what they make a lot. And I enjoy wrapping myself up in it and pretending I'm a superhero. <laughs> it keeps me nice and warm and I like to cuddle it because it's so soft. <laughs> well, we can't tell you who they are. No, but if you are a longtime listener, you are <laughs> definitely aware of what it is. And if you're new, you're like, what the heck is wrong with these people? They are not superheroes. And you cannot cuddle things because you are grown men. Darn it. <laughs> And this is not what we do. Oh my god! Um, things are getting finalized, and cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know I'm not able to go to Envelade, partly because it's on the other side of the country. Yeah. I don't fly, and the timing isn't right, <laughs> and I don't know that I could afford to get out there anyway. Um, but all that aside, I kind of want to go because of that. Yeah. Ugh. That would be a lot of. I, I wish the unnamed entity or entities could come to an event out here near us. <laughs> That'd well, we be awesome, to, wouldn't it, though? It would be awesome, or we could go to one uh, closer to them. Well, there's one at Con <laughs> that is just down the road from them. Um, yeah. That I've recommended to you. I don't know how we would do it, I, which I actually want to go to. I, I don't quite know how, and I have no idea how expensive it is. Yeah, uh, well, I mean... No, I said I'd, I'd be I'd be totally up for that. We'll, just, we'll have to look into it, and something else might have to suffer. But we'll yeah, we if we can pull it off. Yeah. Well, unless work decides to mess things up for you again, or I can't remember when I'm going to be out of the state or something like that. Maybe you'll have another trip, or they'll want to send you to Michigan this time. I I mean I don't know. Yeah. Minnesota. Oh, let, let's pick another uh, state up there near the Great Lakes. Yeah, you we'll, have to go to Wisconsin in winter time. I don't know why. I, I don't know why my boss hates me, but. <laughs> Maybe if they saw you smile more and heard you laugh more often, that might do the trick. Maybe. <laughs> They'd be like, we were wrong about that guy. We yeah. don't want to send him to Wisconsin. We want to send him to, I don't know, somewhere sunny. Uh. Oh, well. <laughs> that is crazy. Well, um, speaking of Empilade, uh, I do want to thank him, though, because we're going to be doing a wet palette episode, which, as I say, I sound, I feel weird saying it. But we're going to do a wet palette episode this year, and it's going to be a, a product comparison. Mm-hmm. There's a special wet palette that we were able to. I, I feel, are you familiar with Family Guy? Yes. So, you know the Cool Whip thing? Yes, Cool Whip. <laughs> and I, I can't say the way to For anyone who doesn't know, or just never seen Family Guy, a great, just truly a great, really funny, and also offensive. Um, animated TV series created by Seth MacFarlane from Rhode Island. So he's a, a New England guy and he has these characters. It's a family and the baby of the family can talk and is a genius. Same Stuart or Stewie. And uh, they have a dog who can also talk. Who's a, a liberal and Stewie's sort of, but not really. Um, and they have this thing they do where Stewie doesn't pronounce cool whip the way we all do. He puts the emphasis on the H, yeah. but as I say, wet palette, I feel like I'm Stewie. Say cool whip for some reason. Cool whip. Say cool, cool. Say whip, whip. Say cool whip, cool whip. It's a funny like, episode. It is. It's great. And I know Seth MacFarlane gets asked to do it all the time. People are like dance monkey, dance. Say cool whip. And so he has, to, <laughs> he has to do the thing. I'm like wet palette, wet palette, wet. Palette. And I just I, it makes me feel that way because I'm saying it so many. You never say wet palette as many times as I've said it in the past five seconds. It's like wet palette, wet palette. Wet palette. Really interesting audio, right? Uh, we're doing a wet palette <laughs> episode. It feels weird. I don't know why. It just feels weird. It's a weird word to say. It's like moist. People find that uncomfortable for some reason as we talk about words and not gaming. But um, so there was a wet palette Kickstarter, Everlasting the Wet Palette. This French company was doing it, and we were able to back it because of Enfilade and the NHMGS. And so we're going to do this episode. We're, we're going to compare that to, I think it's a Masterson's wet palette. Um, I'm going to be getting off of Amazon and along with, I believe it's a GW or a private day press one that I already have. And maybe also include a homemade one. Some people do a thing with sponges, a Rubbermaid or Tupperware container, so, you know, plastic, plastic container. Then they use sponges and paper towels as a way of doing it affordable and just kind of see what we think is the best one and what one we like the most and what one looks nicest and so forth. That'll be happening in 2018 at some point. It might not be a whole episode because that's a lot of episode for a wet palette, don't you think? I do. Got this cool palette. 
keeps the paint wet. Next. <laughs> Here's another cool palette. Keeps the paint it, wet. Next. But it's orange. <laughs> Here's this other one. It's black. <laughs> I, I'll go on record as saying I, I, I don't see the huge advantage to wet palettes. Sorry. I mean, it's just the way I work. I don't do huge batches of figures at a time, so maybe that makes the difference. But, yeah. So I'll tell you, um, as I can't refer to myself as a non-painter anymore. I feel bad about that. As a moderate to light painter. Light, light, light. light. Painter, as a limited painter, uh, one of the things I love about wet palettes, and I almost extensively use a wet palette now when I paint, is the blending. Uh, I like to do a lot of custom colors. Yeah, and, they do have that going for them. It's true. And it, I mean, it does stay. So like any paints that you put on it, you can really put it in and they'll stay for days on yeah. depending on what one it is. Uh, so you can actually have and then just come back to it. And with my life with a, a toddler, I don't get a whole lot. I can't just sit down for four hours and paint. Yeah. So when I paint, I'm like half hour spurts. And I think for people like me, or if you say you work a lot of jobs or you're just really busy or on the road a lot or you get interrupted a lot for whatever reason, you listen to a lot of podcasts or you get uh, some friend who's like, dude, you got to come on my show and I'm not going to shut up about it. And they just, they're always bugging you to do things that you don't want to do. I like hate paint, that guy. In between painting and they just won't shut the heck up. Uh, <laughs> you might need a wet palette. Uh, so it just, it saves you for that. So you can be like, okay, fine. And you put the thing and you close it up and you go. Or for the blending. I mean, I love Vallejo paints and the eyedroppers. Make it great. Yeah. You control, so you put it on, get just the right amount, do some blending. So maybe the color you really wanted wasn't in stock at your local game store or online or wherever you go and get, or uh, maybe they don't make the color that you really want. So you can just kind of make it different enough to make it unique. That's part of the reason why that famed or infamous claims to wear objective marker that me over 12 hours to paint. Took oh so my long. God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, really. you, had, you had to get just that right shade of green. I did. No, us, us drab. That's not good enough. I gotta have it. Just, <laughs> It's all those browns. I was like, I need dirt, but it can't be that dirty. I need a little less dirty. And now I also want to use a brown for this, but not that brown. So, and then like I, I, I'd write down these intense like formulas for the colors I use four and a half drops of this with three and a quarter drops of this, but then mix it with that other color that I made by this. But I don't quite remember what the other color was I did. So it's in there. You just mix a little <laughs> white palette. I would never paint anything if I had to do all that crap either. I, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Not to that extreme. But I mean, I, I mix them even just a little bit because I want things to just be slightly different. I don't want it to look yeah. like everyone else's. Yeah. So even if I just want a green and I could just pour it out of the bottle, I'm going to make it slightly different. Yeah. It might not be noticeably different, but I know. And that's all that counts. Knowing's half the battle, G.I. Joe. Okay. So, uh, wet palettes, we'll, we'll do a segments, <laughs> segment video. We'll do something with it. I feel like we just did. <laughs> we did the pre wet palette episode here at William and Recon. Mm -hmm. So, we get that coming with thanks to Enfilade. Uh, speaking of thanks, I feel like we should thank our Wargaming Recon Army members. And I want to thank Patrick. And we have many other Wargaming Recon Army members, many different reward levels. We had big changes that came. All the new reward levels are active. And we got some really cool ones there. And one of them uh, that I think is extra exciting recently got snapped up. So, Adrian, are you familiar with the reward levels? No, I don't pay any attention to that stuff. I didn't think you would. So I will give a brief rundown. There's many, or I feel there's many reward levels. but. There's a couple that really excite me. So there's one where you get thanked by name and you get other stuff. But like that's that's a big thing that will thank you on air uh, for being a supporter. But there are two others that really excite me. <coughs> Sorry, three others. Because three is a magic number. And I'm just referencing everything today, aren't I? Uh, so one of them we call Army Rations. It costs $10 per month for six consecutive months. And then you get like a model box type of thing, a loot crate, geek fuel sort of thing. It's a package that comes with a Wargaming Recon bumper sticker. It gets a Wargaming Recon postcard that has a personalized message. You get some Wargaming Recon custom dice. And then any other surprises that we kind of um, think are cool, 
we want to put in. They might be gaming things, they might be models, or whatever. So it makes it unique. Another one is something we call military intelligence. It's $15 a month where you get to suggest a game or product for us to review. It should be something interesting and also accessible. And then we will pick it up and we'll review it on an upcoming episode of the podcast or on the video channels. But the one that someone snapped up that I think is very interesting is our most expensive level. It's called Army HQ. It costs $25. And if you back at this level, you get to produce one episode of the podcast. And what that means is you get to pick the topic. You choose what segments we do, the order they, that we do them, or which segments that we don't do. So maybe you really hate mailbag. Don't hate mailbag. It's my favorite. Um, but maybe <laughs> maybe you really hate it. And you're like, get out of here, mailbag. You're as unwanted as being flanked. <laughs> it goes. Um, so someone recently picked that up. And I don't know yet what episode they want to produce or what they want for content or anything. We'll be talking with them. But I'm really excited about that. I think it will make for some interesting viewpoints and uh, things that maybe we wouldn't have covered otherwise. Yeah. Broaden the scope, but keep it about the hobby that we all know and love. So that's pretty cool. So people can back us on Patreon. We'll have a link in the show notes, wargamingrecon.com slash WR200. That's wargamingrecon.com slash WR200. And anything else you want to cover today, Adrian? Uh, no, we're two hours and seven minutes into it. Uh, we've covered everything we need to talk about today. So that means I should talk for another <laughs> 50 years, odd minutes, right? You can if you want to, but I'm leaving. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so we've got the Patreon. You can check us out on there. We are, of course, on social media, um, big on Facebook. I have to give a huge shout out to Jamie, our social media coordinator, who's really taken the helm for Twitter because I will admit I don't quite understand Twitter, and I never really used it a lot. That whole 140 character, I think we up to 280 now. I think we got bumped up uh, to the new character limit. But I just I don't get it. I don't really understand what I'm supposed to do with it or what's supposed to go on, but Jamie does. So any tweets you see on our Wargaming Recon Twitter account or responses or anything, they're from him. So he does a great job. I'm very appreciative of that. And uh, he's continuing to do it. So I appreciate that because otherwise we would just have it. Nothing would ever be done with it. Do you get Twitter? Do you understand it? I mean, you have one. You tweet, right? I, I don't really tweet very much in fact i would say i don't really tweet at all occasionally i'll respond to something mostly what i use it for is um like the people i follow is just to get like news updates and stuff and it's like they'll put something out and it's like oh maybe i should go read that that kind of thing mm -hmm. um yeah twitter doesn't really doesn't interest me that much i'm very confused about it i think the most interesting thing about it recently is that there's this war that's gone hot now between Leo Laporte and Twitter for, um, I don't think it's copyright, but like trademark or whatever infringement because of Twit and Twitter and Twitter promised, although they claim they never did, but they promised way, way back that they were never going to branch out beyond being a micro blogging platform of 140 characters. And they would never infringe on the Twit audio and video multi-platform thing about Bob. Uh, but now they're going into video. And Leo Laporte's not happy and thinks people are going to be confused and that they violated their agreements and so forth. So there's a legal war. It's gone hot. I don't think a lot of hearts would be broken if Twitter like went away. I know mine wouldn't. They don't make money. Well, Facebook doesn't make money either, but they don't make money. I don't know if I'd miss Facebook all that much either. I am actually very active on Facebook, but I don't know if I would miss it. I if there was like a new Facebook, I mean, by new Facebook, I mean like new social media platform that did Facebooky things, like allowed us to connect with one another the way it does with the groups and stuff. I'd be yeah. okay as long as everyone was on it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, anybody that even attempts to start something new, um, not say anything about you know G plus or anything like that. But yeah, yeah, it's like Google. Oh man, Guy yeah. Kawasaki. I, I don't know what they were doing with that. That's just. Nice try, but a swing and a miss. And there's been so many of them. Yeah, I mean, and, anyway, and it, social media. Depends is, on the age. 
Yeah, social media is okay, but like literally if every social media platform blew up tomorrow, I couldn't possibly care less. Yeah, they're not your thing. I don't think of you as a social media guy. I'm not a social guy. <laughs> you put up with me though, so that's that says something about you. Yeah, it's odd. I don't know. You have patience. That's what it is. I do have that. You do have that in spades. Well, thank you, Adrian, for being on this very special episode of War Gamer Recon. No problem. It was a lot of fun. Two hours and ten minutes now worth of fun. It was great. <laughs> Would you say it was two hours and ten minutes of valuable, very special time on War Gamer Recon of content? Uh, sure. If that's what we want me to say, if that's going to get us <laughs> to end this episode, that's what I'll say. Um, yeah, no, I think it was it, it was a good show. It was, uh, I enjoyed seeing uh, everybody's picks, and they, a lot of them. I was really surprised and happy to see how many of them would have aligned with with stuff that I would have picked. So that was cool. Whenever there's a special episode, all kidding aside, people like anniversaries, right? So you, you like ten years, you like five years, you like number of anniversaries. There's a hundred of this, a thousand of that, or whatever. Two hundred is special. I mean, 250 we'll celebrate too because 250 is special too. But like 200 episodes, it's a thing most podcasts never get there. And we would have been there far sooner than now, except we do like 25 episodes a year because we do every other week, roughly. So if we were doing weekly, we would have been here ages ago. So it takes a while. So not only are we the longest running tabletop working podcast in existence anywhere as far as we know, anywhere really. 200 episodes is a thing. A lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of patience goes into getting there. And it's only possible because of, I mean, people like you, Adrian, who are willing to come on and put up with being with me. But the listeners, really, because if, if you guys and girls are not listening to the show, we're not going to make 200 episodes, right? It's just it's not going to happen. So yeah. the fact that you enjoy it and you think there's something here and you get some value from it, uh, we keep chugging along and we keep on doing it. And Hopefully we'll be able to do 200 more and who wants to do something special. And I kind of felt that to do something special, a good way to do it is to kind of turn the camera around, turn the mic around and allow you, the listener to get a voice And whether it's a listener uh, literally being on the episode or sharing viewpoints from listeners. And I've always said my favorite part of the show is interacting with you and interact with the community, the people who uh, like what we do, just getting to know all of you and being able to uh, share what you like and what you don't and give you a voice. And uh, not everyone will do or wants to do a podcast. Uh, So the fact that we are doing it here and I like to think that we are giving you guys and girls a voice here. Uh, So I felt it was a a nice way to kind of tie all that together and do it for the 200th episode. I mean, we're not going to do it for every episode because then it wouldn't be a very special episode, now would it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be like all the other episodes, which are just another episode. Yeah, those mundane ones that just aren't, you know, worth your time or anything because they're not very special. They're just special. Right, right. Well, they're just a very episode. <laughs> they're not anything else. Um, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I really do think we get good stuff going on. And for the past couple of years, I, I felt like each year is like the best year we've had that we, we've done something really cool or innovative. We've had people on that I've always wanted to get on or that um, listeners or, or co-hosts or guests have wanted us to get on. It just it seemed like we've hit it out of the park. I, I really do feel that way. But this year, I think it's even going to be better. I really do. And I've never really been caught up in numbers of uh, l- downloads or listeners or that kind of stuff or awards or whatever. But I, this year, I would actually love if there was a way for us to, uh, not for me and, and not for you, Adrian. I mean, it'd be nice if you you got recognized in some way. But like for the listeners, really, like if the show was able to receive an award, like for the listeners, and because I mean, everyone we, we're part of a larger ecosystem as we talk, as we talked about, but we all come together and, and make it a, a better one. I think, but just to kind of all honor all of you. So I don't know what that award would be. There's actual podcast awards out there. There's uh, like internet awards and, and game awards and stuff, Webbies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we would fit into categories or some of them. So if I find out about any of those that might be applicable, we put in the word out. And if you also share the word and you vote and do all that kind of stuff, who knows? Maybe this will be the year we end up with an, uh, an award on your behalf. It'd be kind of cool. Be, Don't be, you think? Yeah. You know, then, what else I, you know what else I think? What? If we backed up about two minutes and we're talking about all that community stuff, 
I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to start to tear up. We talked about that earlier <laughs> in the episode. <laughs> you mean how I'm in touch with my feelings? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say it, it would have been great if we had won an award and won it before we were on the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been better, yeah. And then they would have been like, <laughs> but then it would have been really funny because they would have been like award winning podcasters. And they would have had like my name when I was on. And then you, when you were on, and maybe the mistake got made, it got in the thing or not. <laughs> it would have your name as award winning podcaster. And, then they were... <laughs> and this guy that clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Which it's funny, not only just because it's funny, and, um, but also because. The mistake that was made, I'm not going to mention it because I don't know if it's a thing or not, but I believe I also made it on an episode of the show and I think I got called out, <laughs> called out about it. <laughs> and it just, it was a slip of the tongue. Yeah. Yep. And it happens. Um, and, I, and I think if it, if it made it into the show, into the movie, and if we then explain it, I think people un- understand why it, how it could have happened, but that doesn't make it better. Do you know what? If it's not in the screen version, I think I'm going to reach out to Steve and ask if he can do a special director's cut that includes it as like a bonus feature. As a special gift for you. That'd be great. It'll be just in your copy of it. Yeah. It'll be just like a special thing. So like you can show anyone you want and like there it'll be. So you will always remember it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like when we had Sam Mustafa on, and I said his name. And I was so embarrassed, and I was wrong. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Mustafa, I was like, his name is like the Lion King, Mufasa. So it must be Mustafa. <laughs> and he, and to his credit, he was very classy. He just, he said it the correct way. Yeah. <laughs> and he went on. But then in my head, it was like, Mustafa, Mustafa, wet palette, wet palette, cool whip, cool whip, Mustafa. <laughs> and that's what I did. In my head, but I remember now it's Mustafa yeah. all the time. I got it in, but there you go. You two will remember. So, next time we get a really cool episode on, you're back on that episode in case you didn't remember it. And I believe we are planning to review, or at least for part of it anyway, uh, Travel Battle by the Perry Miniatures. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know that was coming up so soon, but yeah, that'll be good. I think it's next time, or maybe it's the one after it. I don't remember. It's in the episode guide, which you can get to by going to the show notes at wargamingrecon.com slash WR200. I'll do that as soon as we're done with this very long, very special episode. <laughs> it is a very, very special episode. Well, thank you again, Adrian, for being on. And thank you for being part of the team. Yeah. To make the show special and being part of the community and doing all the things that you do to make Wargaming Recon special with 200 episodes and counting. We'll make the next 200 also special. Do you think you'll be around for the next 200? No. Yeah, I don't think you will either. Um, it'd be great if you were, but it just I don't think you will. So maybe I won't be either. Maybe I'll be. This could be it. This could be it. This is why we need the award now, while we're all still here. Yeah. Write your senators, people. Write them. Write them now. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode, this very special episode of Wargaming Recon. Uh, Two hundred episodes is something, and I hope you enjoyed it. We will have more great content in twenty eighteen. As always, you know, you can check out the show notes at wargamingrecon.com slash WR200. That's wargamingrecon.com slash. I just lost the URL. Wargamingrecon.com slash WR200. Um, I was just thinking that I also wanted to take a moment to thank the rest of the team. Uh, not everyone was able to make it. So, Alex, thank you very much, buddy. Joshua and Jamie, thank you very much. Any of you who are listening to this podcast and thinking it sounds halfway decent, if you think it sounds great or good, you can thank Joshua for that. He's a very skilled audio technician, audio engineer in Down Under. And he does magic so that I sound passable and that Adrian, you sound great as always. Yeah. So he deserves an award for making me sound passable. Yeah. That alone, I think, is there. So you guys know the drill. We try doing it differently. And Adrian, I think you said it didn't feel right <laughs> when you listened to it and when you desire it. Yeah, no, you got to you gotta do it full corn. Yeah. I really got to cheese it up and uh, we, we get feedback. I get feedback. People like the enthusiasm. They they like the energy, the youthfulness. Something that always appears and feedback and in reviews and ratings get rated very high on this. And that's not why I do it. I mean, it, it's there. I'm, 
Would you say I'm a high energy, very enthusiastic kind of guy? For short periods of time, yeah, you get very enthusiastic in the initial stages of a project. Then it kind of falls off. Like a puppy? No, a puppy can usually pick it back up. You never can. I see something shiny and then I move on to something else. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but uh, in terms of doing the show and everything, yeah, I would say you're very enthusiastic. Like a little kid. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. Childlike wonder. I think that's what you're supposed to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone, you know the drill. No matter how busy you are, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how much time you want to spend to very special episodes of Working for Recon or anything else in your life, you know that you have to, you gotta, you need to keep on gaming. If you could have just talked for another nine minutes, that would have been two and a half hours. Oh, well, since we're still live, I can keep on going here. Well, you're going to be doing it alone. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>